Rochester Stockbridge Unified District Board of School Directors regular meeting Tuesday, March 2nd, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. via Google Meet. Uh, and we're calling it to order at 6.33 p.m. Uh, adjustments to the agenda. Uh, we will remove 7.5 because uh, we don't know the result of that vo vote, as nicely pointed out by Charity Colton. That's a strange thing to talk about. Um, uh, or just premature. Um, and then, what was it, 7.2? Oh, yeah, audit sale, uh, 7.3. We just need to remove audit sale and just uh, a 1920 audit sale of just Rochester High School building. Is that correct, Jamie? Yep. Yeah. Uh, are there any other uh, adjustments to the agenda anybody has like to bring in tonight? I saw Carl's hand up. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if we, uh, if uh, now certainly we, we can have it, we can leave it in 7.7 uh, 7 as a discussion item. But I'm, you know, again, given that we don't know the outcome of the vote, um, I think approving a warning as an action item in 8.2. Um, is perhaps premature. We would we uh, would probably want to create create a warning when we know uh, uh, what the what the, the the I mean yes we'll still be operating twenty one twenty two as a combined district uh, uh, regardless. I can't see any way that that that, that wouldn't happen. But I, I do think it's probably premature to, to take a, to take action on a uh, uh, a warning until we know the outcome of our vote. Unless you wanted to act out of an excess of optimism like me, Carl. We could act out of an excess of pe pessimism <laughs> as well. Um, no, I, I, I just, like no, I said, I, I think, for example, the warning would have to have, like, I think the warning now has stuff about the election of officers. And part of the AOA terms was the consideration of making the election of officers a uh, uh, Australian ballot vote. Yep. So okay. I, I think we should we should hold off on that piece. No, I think you're, that's that's a very valid point. Thank you. You're um, welcome. Uh, uh, should we just, Jamie? What do you think? Should we just cut it out? You know, it's fine. I mean, we went back and forth with this. We didn't know if we'd have the results by then or not, and um, that's part of why I said possible. And in my board report, I said to you that we very well may. Need, I'm going to ask you to set a special meeting tonight, so for just that that action. So, okay, great. Um, so let's keep it and we can talk about, is that what you want to talk about that future board meeting or? Yeah. I mean, I just, at some point when we come to discussion, maybe if I could get a date from you guys about when you want to, when we want to warn a special meeting, I think when Tara and I looked, we would have enough time to do it before. If we did a quick special meeting before the. Um, full board meeting. I don't know if that night works for you guys, just because a lot of you are at the full board meetings anyways. That's something we could consider. The policy committee moved when they're meeting now. And it's not before the full board meetings. Uh, so that's an option, but we can take care yeah, of that. Yeah. But we can decide that then. Okay, good. So let's uh, just approve. Uh, can I have a motion to approve the changes to the agenda we have suggested? I make a motion to approve the changes that we've suggested to the agenda. Thank you, Amy. Seconds by Carl. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 I got you, Jenny. Thank you. Um, all right, moving on. Let's do um, approving the minutes. And again, always, as always, Jenny, want to thank you for these. Um, approve uh, minutes of Tuesday, February 2nd, 2021, regular. Um, do we have... Anybody have any specific notes on any of these, or could we move them as a slate to accept? I think Jenny's note keeping has been exemplary. I move we uh, we approve all the the minutes as a slate. Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Good. Board comment. Any comments? Um, yeah, I, I had a question. Um, well, I just wanted to make sure that everybody was getting their uh, correspondence with the VSBA, and it was um, kind of specific to um, to uh, Justine. I wanted to make sure that um, she was getting 
uh, corresponds with them because when I sent out the email about the socks in, in January, she responded that she didn't know what I was talking about. So I don't know who signs board members up for, for that. I'll double check with Christy. That should have been part of her onboarding, but I'll just double check. Okay. Yeah, it's, a, it's an automatic um, address, RSI board, and that should update automatically, correct? That's the way I've always seen it. So that's how I've used it. Well, okay. I'm just, I'll make <laughs> sure. Okay, if you could check. Thank you. Good. But but it's it's uh, the SU and, and Christy who, who manages that. Okay. Great. Good to know. Thank you. Good. Um, any a further board comment, Carl? Um, as I as I struggle to turn on my microphone and, and, and not turn off my camera, um, uh, no, I don't. Other than uh, uh, you know, I uh, dropped off my absentee ballot. Uh, hopefully, the, the 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 entire board did their uh, civic duty as well as well as everyone in our audience and. Whether uh, you voted for or against your participation, I think personally, I would like to thank all of us for participating in democracy. Oh, I agree. Thank you. Um, good. Um, uh, Jenny, any board comment? I do not, but I would like to just have a generic comment that it's some of these discussion items that we have here, I think, are great. And um, it's nice to be moving on to talking about some of these items other than the budget. Yeah, it's a great feeling to go beyond having approved our budget and worked on some tough details and worked a lot of tough stuff actually over the last six months here. And um, I, I really, I'm so sorry again, Justine's gonna miss the uh, outdoor and experiential education um, because I'm just, you know, that's her, that's one of her babies. Um, but uh, yeah, I hear you. It's really great, great. Um, Megan, are you on and do you have any board comment? I saw, I think I saw the last thing she'd left. She seems to be having some issues. Yeah, She's I see that. Going, I think. Left and on and left. Um, okay, well, well, we'll get to her then. All right, I think we're moving on to reports of the board. Let's start the superintendent. So so you have my report in hand. Um, one of the things I had indicated is that we need to discuss when we might want a special meeting so we can take that up under 7-7. Mm -hmm. the, there was news today from the governor's office um, that there is going to be a vaccine available to start vaccinating school um, personnel and staff that come in contact with students. That includes contracted service providers. It includes independent schools and it includes public school employees. The details around that have yet to be worked out or at least um, conveyed to us. Um, we, you know, I, I was a bit surprised to hear that we might be doing it in schools. Um, and so I think there will be a coordinated effort here at the SU level, much like our surveillance testing to ensure that that goes off without a hitch. Um, and I await those details. I think we're going to get them on Friday. Um, I do have a meeting with Secretary French on Thursday, a soups meeting. I think a lot of those details may come out there too that would assist us with planning and preparation. Um, it seems like registration will occur next Monday um, for folks to start getting registered for that. So I did put a correspondence out to faculty and staff with as much information as I had in a timely manner this afternoon. Um, and so that was a big update. Um, the other thing I wanted uh, to uh, let folks know is, is that presenting tonight about the outdoor ed is going to, I didn't put the names down last week when I did the agenda because I wanted to be able to confirm with them. So it's going to be Bana and Melissa and Owen Bradley from uh, the White, Ri White River Unified District. And Bana and Melissa have been doing a lot of great things with outdoor ed now for a while. And I got to see some of it firsthand this fall and was really impressed. So they're going to give you a brief presentation and answer questions folks may have about that. Um, and then, you know, we await uh, anxiously. We've got two districts voting today, plus all the articles that are on about our set. So I'm, uh, I'm hoping for some positive outcomes and results tonight. Carl, you had your hand up. Uh, thank you. 
Uh, yeah, I was just wondering the the you know speaking to the idea of the in school clinics, they were saying that as an option, you know, a school or a grouping of schools could uh, vaccinate their employees at a location with the the J and J a vaccine. I was just wondering if that was something we were interested in pursuing, or if you would the if it's too soon that you guys haven't had a conversation about that. You know, um, if we, we were- haven't had a conversation yet, but my my inclination, Carl, is is that's what's going to get it um, to our educators. Then that's what we'll prioritize, and we'll figure out how to coordinate it. Um, and so I did have a brief conversation with Shane Oaks, our COVID coordinator today, um, about the logistics around that. And so, you know, I certainly want to prioritize making certain that our folks have it and that it's accessible to them. Um, I wish, you know, part of me feels like I wish they would look back at this monthly survey data and see we've been in school five days a week at the elementary school since September 8th. And maybe that would help us move up the list of priority. I don't know if it's going to work that way, though. Well, it's certainly in great news. Um, Absolutely. It's just, it's like, you know, you could get teary about it if you thought about it. It's, um, it's really, really wonderful. All the. Yeah. And I, 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 I really commend you for, you know, being proactive about trying to, to, to move forward on this rather than just being like sending out the, 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 the link to the sign up webpage to teachers to try to, to think about and discuss the idea of us, you know, making it as easy as possible and as, as quickly as possible for our staff, you know, to, to get protected so that, that we can be interacting uh, with our kids a lot better and, and uh, uh, you know, feeling a lot better about it. Yeah. Good. Other questions for the superintendent? Amy? Yes. I uh, noticed in uh, the report you were talking about the um, annual uh, report and mailer that we do, and that is definitely a, something I talked to Ethan about that we need to discuss how we're gonna go about doing this. Last year, um, Ethan and I believe Jenny worked quite hard on putting it together a really great book with a lot of great charts and color coding. Um, and uh, I, I'm kind of wondering what the plan is for this year. Uh, in years past, um, it's been off and on with the support from the SU on, on getting the book together. So um, just kind of wondering where we're going. Well, we're going to go wherever you guys direct us to go. So, you know, we have we put together uh, the administration in, in coordination with the board, put together the White River Unified District mailer, separate from the town. Um, and that came out quite well, I think. Um, but then in Stratford, we provided all the materials to the town of Stratford, and then they included in their town book. And so it's really whatever you desire, Amy. I mean, we will provide you with all the materials, documents, letters, pictures, and you guys can then coordinate that. Or you can give us your report and say, this is the method, we, this is the template, and just fill it in. So it's really whatever you guys desire as a board. We, that's funny, I'm sorry, I, I, Amy, we talked about that, and I think we even mentioned that we thought it should be an agenda item. Um, yeah, when we saw it in his report, I figured I didn't need to add it. <laughs> So. Yeah. Oh, I, 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 I just really need you to give us a direction one way or the other. Well, I, I mean, there's some things day. that should probably be shared too about this. I mean, that was an all out sort of effort last year um, and trying to figure that out. Um, it was also expensive. Um, color printing of that amount is, is very expensive. Um, and that's something we probably need to take into consideration. Um, but I, I certainly, I mean, I, I loved what we did. I'm wondering if we could do it for less. That's sort of what, you know, if there's a way we can make it for less. But maybe I can show you. I've got the file. I think, uh, Jenny, maybe you and I can both check to see who has the final, the last file. I think I think it's me. Um, one of the big changes we did was we put all the um, Excel into, a, uh, into Word, um, which is times take... Um, painstaking but so much easier to read for the lay person i i got responses back to that so that's one big change so anyway um uh how do you think of jenny do you want to sit down and make an hour and talk to each other and see what we can pass on yeah that sounds good um it would be good to know if there's some way we could do it for less cost but if we ended up doing what we did last year we do have that template that we can um go from as a starting point. 
Yeah, good. Okay, let's let's you and I. Um, I'll make a note, and you and I find a time to get together and and chat about that. Are your are you usually evenings better for you? Um, it, it varies in general, yes, but um, I'll get, can I'll get, find a time I'll that get works. Better. So, do we have a a breakout of of cost comparison of of color versus not color or this year versus years or you know last year's versus years in the past i mean like how much more expensive was it and was it just because of color or was it also because of length because it wasn't me, it was, it was a lot longer we added a lot more explanations in it um which was wonderful tara do you want to speak to what you just what we came across for it rod and then what your experience was I used a different supplier for the red mailer this year, and the cost was higher than what we normally spend um, with the supplier that we use, but we had a time and issue. So it does cost more um, to have color pages. So what we had done is elected to do just the cover page color, and then all the subsequent pages were black and white which saved us some some dollars there. And the length of the mailer absolutely does have an impact on how much the cost is, how many copies you need. Um, well, no, certainly a, a, a big decision last year was whether we do an online version, because um, that could save enormous. I mean, I hate to take money of, you know, business away from Spalding Press. Well, you, you should do an electronic copy, but by statute, you're required to no. send your budget information to your registered voters and not everybody has access to go online. So you still should do. Um, I am realizing that we're sort of overtaking Jamie's report in the middle of reports. And um, it is too bad that we didn't make this agenda item because we, um, um, we really obviously need to talk about it. Um, let's finish up with Carl and then Amy, and then I think we'll, we'll move on from now. And Jenny, Jenny, you know, maybe we can uh, piggyback on that special meeting. Uh, Jamie. Yeah. I, I was going to suggest just that, okay. Ethan. I was going to say we don't have it on the agenda. Let's not spend a lot of time on it. But I also wanted to toss out that um, uh, I was hearing from a friend of mine that, that other towns are doing um, the, the legal minimum in terms of a mailing and then putting links on their website and then a URL in the mailing that says, you know, for the, 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 the full version, go online to here. And that's where they are doing – the, the 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 glamour color photos and the 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 montages of what the kids have been doing so far and all that sort of stuff. So I, I do think having a discussion about that quickly at our special meeting might be worthwhile so we can 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 get a direction that's both affordable and really informs our, our people, especially since we haven't been able to get together in person. Cool. Amy? Uh, that's okay. I will just wait till uh, next till it's on in the agenda. Great. Thank you. Um, Megan, are you on? I can't see. Yeah, it says you're there. Um, I'm here. I'm here. I've been having a little bit of internet trouble, but I, I hopefully on for good. Good. Um, did you have any more questions for the superintendent on his report? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Good. So I think uh, we're done. That. That's moving on. Uh, to principal's report, please. Um, yeah, so you have our report in front of us. There's not a whole lot of meat to it because we were in school for a pretty short couple of weeks, it seemed like, since we met last at our last regular meeting. But we did have several winter wellness components on both campuses, which was great to see and the kids really enjoyed. And I think it was just as beneficial to stay local and do that. Um, they had cross country experiences, ice skating experiences, snowshoeing experiences, and yeah. everybody seemed to really enjoy that. Um, I think some of the other highlights is, um, is what else? Uh, we had the hundredth day of school before vacation, which was pretty exciting to see kids um, in all classes on both campuses participated in some sort of 100th day of school challenge, whether it was reading 100 minutes, reading 100 books, the list goes on and on. And then we had a little celebration. Um, and then teachers worked together to create these vacation bingo board activities. And um, we have some some fun things I don't want to, I don't want to support 
spoil the surprise because the kids don't even know what the surprises are yet. But uh, there are some great community contributions to system to surprises, even if you just did one activity as a kid. And the yeah. idea was just to keep kids active in a lot of different ways, whether it was reading or being outdoors or um, helping families cook, all sorts of things. So it was a wide array of activities. It was great. We, we had a lot of fun with it. Oh, good. That's great to hear. Yep. So maybe quite a bit of it was done in the last two or three days. Um, <laughs> Don't tell all your secrets. <laughs> yeah. Amy? Um, great. Uh, I would like to um, have a discussion, a further discussion about um, winter wellness and what we foresee for the future. So maybe we can put that on as an agenda item for, for another meeting. Um, Cause I would like to uh, really understand what we did this year and what the benefits and the drawbacks were and, and um, what sure. the for the future would be. Um, and I do also have a question. We had received a letter home the last day of or before February vacation about um, lead tests. And I was uh, wondering, uh, I had thought that, that the um, drinking fountain in the pre-K had been fixed our last year, and I was surprised to see that on this note again this year. Amy, we were. This is Bonnie. Uh, we were surprised to see that too. We actually had that whole whole bubbler replaced. Um, as you'll recall, the state mandated a lead testing throughout uh, public schools last spring and um <clears throat> or late fall i guess it was and we got indication that there were three or four uh fixtures that we needed to address and we addressed them uh, a couple we just took out they're no, no longer in service they were in the high school the one that we wanted to make sure of was the bubbler in the preschool which we completely replaced one of the things they're thinking about is um the fixture was replaced and then we immediately shut down. So it sat unused for several weeks, uh, several months. And um, what they've suggested is that we go back through the testing cycle again, which we began two weeks ago. And what that cycle is, is you run the fixture uh, twice a day for five minutes for a period of two to three weeks and then retest. So we are going to retest um, uh, the fixtures that came back above the prescribed level. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll find satisfactory levels. If not, then we'll have to have a discussion about uh, next steps. Okay, and this you say the, a bubbler is that a component that's inside of the drinking fountain, or um, is that the whole? Is it a drinking fountain? Uh, yeah, it's I'm a not drink sure. Yeah, it's one. Of, it's like one of the stainless steel fountains that you see. You know, it's all one piece. It's got a chiller and a and a bubbler. Okay. It's it's one integrated piece. So, um, we did put a whole brand new unit in the preschool, as I said. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I'll just add that across the SU, what we've been finding is it sometimes is the brass fittings behind the actual bubbler itself. And so Lyle, uh, who's been working for us in the SU, has been advising our custodians ahead of maintenance to change out the brass fitting and that tends to be clearing it up so that's that would be the next step for us to address that but good eye good eye amy i missed that thank you um uh, further questions for the principals jenny i'm all set thank you thank you megan yes um hey guys just want to say thank you for the break bingo. We loved it. My family has taken total advantage of it and had, had a really good time with it. Um, I also just wanted to ask a couple of questions, just a question about the, well, the afternoon program at both schools in Stockbridge and Rochester, how we are going from the, the block learning with the more arts and integrated um, classes in the afternoon. But what are we, why are we switching and um, is it happening on both campuses? It's not happening on both campuses. Uh, and staffing is a huge piece of the puzzle for a variety of reasons. I'll let Bonnie speak to it um, on the Rochester side. But yeah, that, that, that's correct. Staffing on the Rochester side, uh, we just reached a point where we could no longer staff it. 
uh, despite what I would call Herculean efforts on everyone's part. So we're moving, we are moving beginning tomorrow back to um, the more tr traditional schedule, which means the unified arts classes are increasing in time. Um, the academic blocks are increasing a little bit. Um, but we simply reached the point where every single day we were scrambling to try and find um, people who could staff the activities. Okay. Um, my daughter was, my daughters were just, just wondering why, so I just wanted to be able to give them a, a, a good answer. Okay, thank good you. For, good for them for asking. <laughs> they wanted to know. They enjoy it. Amy. Just to that point, you know, of course, my daughter, same thing. Why are we doing this? So it might be worth a, a quick announcement or conversation with, with the students of why, you know, why things are changing. Yeah, we, we had actually done this. We had actually done this uh, about a week before the break. And we had asked teachers <clears throat> to explain the, the, you know, the new schedule and the fact that we were changing away from the enrichment block. So I, I can't tell you why youngsters don't know that, but um, my hope was that they had had it explained and maybe just don't recall it or don't remember it or, or as Amy said, over her head. Yeah, it certainly was a good model. I hope, I hope we might be able to return to it at some time when vaccines are more prevalent and everything's safer, because I know that's some of staffing issues. Yeah, that was really our big challenge, Ethan. When someone was out, we weren't comfortable. It's not that there weren't people who were willing to come in. I no. think in many cases there were, but we weren't comfortable bringing people into the buildings. I think one of the things I think Lindy and I would tell you is the success that we've had has been related to the fact that basically if you don't uh, work at the school pretty much full time or go to the school, then you haven't been in the school. So we weren't able to draw on resources we typically would draw on as substitutes. Gotcha. No, and, and hopefully these people um, are actively, some of these people are actively seeking vaccines because of course I would think that would change. But I don't know, do we have a clear policy about that? Once somebody has a vaccine, are they considered able to enter the school as a substitute? Or what is our policy? Well, folks can enter the school. I mean, I think certain schools are just being more diligent about are cautious about bringing substitutes in, Ethan. So well, I'm just saying, if somebody gets a vaccine, uh, does yeah, I mean, any any substitute right now can enter our school if they are on the sub list, whether they have a vaccine or not, they can substitute. So there's no policy there. I mean, there's no guidance from the AOE or the SU saying that they can't do that already. So definitely, if they get vaccinated, they can. Mm. So, uh, Bonnie, do you anticipate this changing? Um, is it your goal to get back to the enrichment block? So certainly they were popular. Sometimes it was the best part of the day. Um, I think I think we'd have to have a conversation about that, Ethan. Um, based on a couple of the of the changes in programming, I know the board hopes to make next year. I think that all has to be taken into consideration. Okay. Okay. So another agenda item. Um, well, and I just also think it's important to stress, like, with the enrichment block specials or unified arts throughout the day were 25 to 30 minutes because they were getting that second dose in the afternoon. And now on Rochester's campus, they will push back to a longer length of time. So it just is shifting kind of when it is in the day, not necessarily that they're not getting something. That makes sense. We're just using the time differently. Good. Um, further questions for the principals, Carl? Um, just a quick comment. Uh, I had heard about uh, winter bingo from a community member who said that they had heard about it and thought it was cool. And it's been a long time since a community member has come up to me and said something positive. So good job, you guys. Well done. Great. Great. Um, Anybody, Jenny, did I get to you? Do you have a question for the principals? I forgot. I'm all set. Okay, good. Thank you. And I think we're ready to move on. Thank you to the business manager, please. Hello, Tara. Good evening, everyone. So you have my report. Um, Ray, if you want to put up the revenue and expenditure summary, I can go over that with you. Um, if you have any questions 
specific to my report, please let me know. I will give just a quick update on the ESSER II funding. Um, we are working to get our recovery plan together um, and meet the deadlines that the state has established for getting the stakeholders and all of that information into them. And those funds uh, need to be used for learning loss, preparing schools for reopening, testing, repairing, and upgrading projects to improve the quality of the air. And then um, will be funded similar to the way that we are funded through our title services. So more to come as we learn more on the SR2 funds. So on the revenue and expenditure summary highlighted in orange is what I've updated. Um, there's the prior month, what was there, and the updated projection through the end of February. So you'll see, Ray, if you want to scroll down just a tiny bit, you'll see that the current projected deficit for FY21 has gone down to the 28.917. I have added... Um, on the revenue side, we reduce the pre-K tuition revenue based on current enrollment invoicing, increase the interest income to $6,365 based on the current revenue received. We added $318 in miscellaneous income that's come in, $810 for donations. And then I forgot to highlight the, the one there, the VCF grant revenue that Stockbridge received for $5,000. And then we updated the COVID reimbursement to the $40,099 $40, based on the increase on the expenditures. And then Ray, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, I have updated, oh, on the revenue page, sorry, Ray, right there. I have updated the fund balances based on your FY20 audit. So that has now been updated as well. So then Ray, if you can go ahead and go to the expenditure side. The change there is the COVID reimbursement, the $40,099. And then if you scroll down to the projected areas of savings, the field trips, um, there's been some busing, so I dropped that down to $3,500 there. We've got an increase in books, it looks like, of $11,914. We added in contracted services that haven't been utilized for $26,779. General supplies that haven't been utilized, uh, $15,742. And then updated the tuition budget versus invoiced to date. Uh, we got about a $60,000 savings there. Obviously, if any additional invoices come in, that's subject to change. But those were the updates that I made on your revenue and expenditure report. Hi, couldn't nobody can hear me. Thank you, Tara. Um, Amy, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Oh, you're, you're muted now. <laughs> okay. From there one to another. There you go. From one to another. Okay. So, um, okay. If we could go to the expenditures, um, the tuition, um, the, uh, the $60,000 you're saying is for, um, everything that we've been invoiced, um, to date, has been paid on um, and but is isn't there isn't there outstanding kids on um, that we haven't been invoiced for yet is, is that what you're saying it is invoiced to date so obviously if any other invoices come in between now and the end of the fiscal year that number will be updated but we've received the majority of semester one and semester two invoices at this point so i felt that it was an appropriate time to put it on there but again we continue to track that on a monthly basis All right because there is um one two three four there's like five schools that we have only paid the first tuition payment so so you so we so have to pay the what the total invoice amount is for both semester one and semester two. You, so if there are tuitions eighteen thousand dollars for the full year. That's the number that I used in this projection. Okay, their full you. annual tuition. That's what I was kind of wondering. Yes. Yeah, this is the projection, not actual. So, yeah. 
we think if we were built on them on the first semester, we're going to expect to be built on them on the second. The, right. This is the, the this is money that has not shown up to be billed for any students at this. Correct. Time. Okay. And um, uh, I had another question, but I didn't write it down. So um, I'm come back to you. Yeah, come back if I sure. come up with anything. Uh, I'm not sure what order here, but I'll go to Jenny next and then Carl. Um, so two questions. The first one, Tara, I was wondering if you could remind us. Um, so the deficit went down to 28,917, and I was wondering if you could remind us what it, what it was the last time we saw this, or at least approximately. I have that right in front of me last month. It was uh, 137,801. Okay. And then the second question, Tara, I was wondering if you could just, um, you may have talked about this previously, but I don't remember if you can um, um, just give a little explanation of what the VCF grant revenue is, where that came from. That was my question too. I'm going to direct that to Lindy because that was a principal grant that was issued and they completed it and received the fundings. Right. So um, both principals received one. This was uh, mini grants that the VPA put out and you had to emphasize on how you're going to use the funds for in-person learning to support social emotional growth of kiddos and potentially in an outdoor setting. So those funds are funds we've been able to access to furnish uh, different parts of, um, you know, what teachers need to instruct outdoors, not necessarily outdoor education, but, you know, a classroom under a tent more so. And other, other materials that have kind of come up that, you know, you can't all go to the communal pencil bucket anymore. It's got to be there, not that we didn't have the pencils, but just organizational pieces. Uh, we also did yoga mats for all our students, sleds for students, things like that is where that money is being used right now. Um, just thinking equity here, was this just for Stockbridge, this grant? This one was, but Rochester also received one as well. So it, that's the total amount. The $9,000 is what both campuses received. Okay. Is this the one you wrote for each other? And you each yeah. got Yeah. You know, I yeah. wrote Rochester's Bonnie and wrote. Doctor. Yeah, I remember, I remember that. My favorite memories from the board last year. Raised money for the other school. Now that's equity. Um, very good. Thank you. That that clarifies that a lot for me. The, uh, Carl, the, other thing, oh, sorry. Ethan, the other thing, the other thing I think it's important to know is that when we wrote the grants, even though Stockbridge got a grant and Rochester got a grant, um, that money was spent across both campuses. Right. So the, the first grant we got, we bought uh, equipment for both Stockbridge and Rochester. And then when we got the second grant, we bought equipment for both Rochester and Stock, Stockbridge and Rochester. That's great. Always good to have that in the public record. Good. So to um, clarify, it was $5,000. Yep. To clarify, it was $5,000 total for, for both of those grants that you wrote? No, it was $9,000. No, it was, no, it was almost $9,000. Yeah. So Nine thousand for two grants. Where's the four thousand? Where's that show up in last year? Or? I just wrote a note to find it because what is okay. indicated in my revenue report is only five thousand dollars for Stockbridge. So I'll have to just mean that. I have it all yet. Yet. Oh, One at a time, please. Yeah, I didn't hear you, um, Lindy. What was your comment? I just don't think we've spent it all yet either, Tara. Oh, okay. No, but we should still record it as revenue. Tara, if it helps, Rochester's was late in the fall. It was so that's where you'll be looking for that one. Great, thank you. Thank you for getting that cleared up. Uh, Carl, did you have a question? I did. I wanted to. I, I think I got the answer that when you're looking at the potential areas of of savings on page two, the tuition budgeted versus invoice to date, we're we're, we're capturing an extra sixty thousand two forty nine. Um, and that number is is not no kid in that in that number is a kid that we paid first semester for, and we're still waiting for a se second semester bill. This is just kids that we thought were going to be going, and they're not going anywhere. We didn't get billed first semester, and we don't expect a second semester. Is that correct? Correct. It is who I have physically received invoices from receiving districts to date. 
And Carl, there's always a couple of those uh, young adults that we, at the time of budgeting, we budget for them to attend, um, but then they're accepted into the VAST program. So every year, as long as I've been at Rochester, there's been two or three seniors who get accepted into the VAST program after the budget's been finalized. Oh, absolutely. And I would imagine we have a couple homeschool um, you know, high school and middle school kids that we had budgeted for. And then they said, nope, we're staying, we're staying home or we're doing, doing our own thing. And they would be dropping off. I just wanted to make sure that yeah. that 60,000 is, is not, you know, there, there's not a kid that we paid first semester for at, at Woodstock. And then the second semester shows up because if we paid first semester. We can expect to pay second, but if we paid no semesters at this point, we can expect we probably will pay no semesters. And as I understand it, our answer is these are all the no semester kids. These the in dollar amounts that I used is the full year tuition that would be invoiced. Good, uh, Megan. Do you have any questions for our business manager? No, I'm good, thank you. Okay, uh, Amy, ready to go back to you? Yep, thank you. Um, just to help me read, make sure I'm reading this correctly, if we go back to the revenue and we're looking at pre-K revenue, and in our FY21 budget, we budgeted uh, $24,115. Last month, you projected that we were gonna actually receive 31,000, and then, but then this month, um, you're, you've decreased that, that we're only going to project it. And is that due to kids moving? Uh, you had some kids unenroll. Unenroll. Okay. So these are moving targets. If I don't understand changes that. per month, then these numbers are going to change. Gotcha. Yeah, I understand that. Um, now, can you tell me what, where we're getting all this wonderful interest income from? I mean, we projected that is based on if you're not using your tax anticipation note, you gain interest on that. And each month as we get in the bank statements and we book interest to revenue on all of your bank accounts, that is where that revenue is applied. So again, mm -hmm. that fluctuates month to month, depending on how much money you have in your bank accounts, just like your personal bank account. Oh, great. Oh, oh dear, Amy's having some trouble. Um, do we still, yes, Megan's on, so we still have a quorum. And okay. just to, to put in the, you know, also, as far as the expenditure, expenditure side is concerned, as we get closer to the end of the fiscal year, where we're seeing savings in line items, we will start to increase and add or adjust as necessary. So, you know, we're now into February and, you know, we've gotten through first semester, so there's definitely you know, more savings that we're going to realize each month, particularly you know, with budgets are all frozen for non-essential spending, so. Good. Any last questions for our business manager? There being none, very good. Let's move on. Policy committee, the anti-racism policy. And we have this, correct? Yeah, Christy Jay sent this out. I'm sorry. I thought it was going to be linked into the agenda, and it wasn't. We'll make certain it's a live link moving forward. But we sent this out. This is in draft form right now. Um, the policy committee is looking to get feedback from each board on this policy. And then we will be meeting on the fourth Thursday this month to take all the feedback received. And actually, Owen Bradley is the lead administrator assisting with the anti-racism and equity work. And so what we would look for you to do, you can provide comments now if you have them. Otherwise, you can provide them to your policy committee member and or send them to me. And that's Carl. And what we're going to do is in each area, I'm going to put like, all right, purpose of policy number one. And it's a Google Doc. So under comments, we'll put RSUD. And the comments that we had from that local board were, you know, A, B, and C. And then the policy committee is going to take all those comments and now then make the next draft, which we're hoping then is becoming you know, towards the final. So this is really in comment round now at the local district um, level. Uh, what's your 
what's your preference board? Uh, do you want to talk about this now or you want some time uh, to get back? I'd prefer to review and, and, and uh, directly comment to, to Carl and to policy committee. Okay, Jenny, how do you feel? Yeah, I agree with Amy. Okay, uh, Carl? Um, the one thing I would caution everyone uh, to uh, think about is that the document that was presented to you, Ray, if you scroll down farther, you'll see the last couple pages are procedure. And really, that's not where the board is supposed to have, um, you know, our input. We're supposed to make a policy and then trust our administrators to make the procedure to get that. So as we're looking at this, you can certainly look and see what, you know, they're thinking about in terms of in, 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 in terms of procedure. But it is really not our our um, place to really get down into the day to day operational procedural bits. Um, what we really need to focus on is the <laughs> of that second block. That's really the, the the policy because that's where our our role and our work comes from. It's not from uh, um, discussing the 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 attached uh, procedure. I think that's there more for us to have as a reference of how that policy might be, might be implemented uh, and not for us to approve or uh, 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 disprove. Carl, a question on that then. Is it part of deciding policy how often something should happen or is it just the idea of what should happen? In other words, that um, the, it could be part of a policy to get like an annual review or a quarterly review of something. Um, you know, to, 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 to get outcomes or ends, depending, you know, if you want to talk in, in, in policy uh, governance speech. Um, so setting a, you know, uh, setting a review time frame is, is part of, is part of our uh, uh, issue. Um, and we're certainly allowed to, 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 to comment on things or, or say that, you know, we're not getting what we want, but the, the, we are not nickel and diming around uh, 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 the procedural part. We're making a policy part that our, our uh, administrators will use to inform how they, how, how they make procedure. So, I mean, and again, a lot of times you do get a policy that has procedure attached to it. What you can do if you see something in the procedure you don't like is you would say, how would I amend the policy to correct that? So for example, if the procedure doesn't say anything about reporting to the board, you might say, let's make the policy give the board an annual report um, about you know that or a curricular plan or something like that. But okay. getting into to nickels and dimes is not is, is is not where that goes. And since it was attached, I wanted to make sure everyone was 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 clear on that. Good. Uh, we were just finding out of um, uh, Megan. Are you okay to get comments back later? Yes, I think it's, I'd like to review it and um, give comments. And thank you, Carl. That's a really good point. I appreciate that. Good. Okay. I think we're, I think we're, we'll uh, hopefully within the next week, I would think. Right, Carl? It'd be nice to be a little timely about this. If you have comments. Just so things don't lag out too long, you know. But uh, that's our recommendation. So we will get back to that. Okay, moving on. Uh, discussion items, outdoor experiential education presentation of WRVSU outdoor educators on the positive results of implementing outdoor and experiential education. Well, it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce to you Principal Bradley and Bonna Wheeler and Melissa Purdy. And I'm going to hand it over to you, Owen, and I think they do have a slide presentation to go over with you tonight as well. And Ray, do you have a copy of that already or no? Look at that. It's almost like uh, <laughs> this thing is a well-oiled production. So here we go. Good evening. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting us. We're happy to be here and proud to be here. I'm going to do very little talking and hand it off to Bonna and Melissa, and I'm here to answer questions and let you know that it is essential for any program like this to be successful, to have administrative support. And I fully support this program and believe in it. Melissa, Bonna. Okay, thanks Ray. Um, we're, yeah, there you go. Melissa, can you be heard? Yeah, just let me, I'm lagging quite a bit. So if you can't hear me, just let me know. Okay, we can hear you now. Yep. All right. 
So go ahead. You're the first person here. Okay, so we don't have a lot of time, so we're going to kind of fly through this. But um, so I am Miss Honeybee, actually, when I run the outdoor program. And Bonna, when she helps with elementary, is Miss Otter. And she does the middle school program as well as Bonna, right? Not as Miss Otter in the middle school. Yep. Yep. Okay. Mother Luther has called us into her office. She said, bring the children because I would like to speak to them directly. And one of our um, environmental educators from Sharon and uh, getting out in the district is Meg Teachout. And she had said that and it really rang a bell. So let's keep moving. I hope that that says something to you all. Okay, so um, I've read many, many studies about outdoor education being integrated into school programs and all of them share them in um, finding that social emotional connections are found as well as more motivation and engagement in academic learning. Lots of other stuff has, has went too, but these are the two main things um, that came up. And this is throughout the whole world, outdoor programs everywhere. Um, so basically, oh, yep. Yeah. So this, yeah, I'll stay here for one second. You can read that quote, but basically um, it helps with their self-esteem, their, their connection to each other, their emotions, their ability to speak up for themselves, self-awareness, um, curiosity, relationship building, just being out in nature, that vitamin N, which I know most of us living in Vermont have heard that term before, but it, it really does help with your, their mental and physical um, health. And all of that leads to more motivation and enthusiasm for learning academics. Okay, you can. Go I'd like to add while we're, we're switching is that it really helps their focus. I see the big difference yeah. as time goes on with that. Go ahead. Yeah, so students' health and happiness influences their ability to learn. And integrating inside learning with outdoor learning makes happy students, like Bonna said. Um, so we, at our school, at the elementary in Bethel and at the middle school, we um, integrate in, in the elementary, we take the indoor learning, bring it outdoor, outside, which I'll show later in other slides. And we also incorporate environmental education and education of nature and bring that back inside, to in, inside learning. So it's, uh, they both affect each other. Um, all of their senses are engaged, which we all know creates um, and happy learning. The sense of freedom that students have with outdoor learning helps with motivation. And it's important also that we are creating stewards of the earth. Um, at this time in our, our life, we know that it's really important for everybody to understand how important it is to take care of the environment. So that's a big piece of it as well. Okay. Okay, Ray. Okay. The successes of outdoor education are social, mental, and emotional for their health. Um, in the middle school, we have fewer write-ups or suspensions. We are outside in our middle school um, most um, – Owen, you can speak more to that, but in the elementary, I, I don't – I haven't um, followed up on that fact. I can tell you that uh, we attendance increase and behavior decrease, negative behavior. One of the things I want to uh, say to Melissa and Bonna is you have 25 slides and you have a few minutes. So I know we're going to skip some of them. We could sh share the slideshow, but be aware of that. And I can help you stay on time as well. OK. okay. Um, so the teamwork, community, um, like I said, we bring in indoor learning outside. So we can just um, go to the next slide. So we, Owen, would you like us to speak to the important components of outdoor education? It's, um, I believe okay. that. I think that's an important piece, yeah. Yeah, so I do too. So it's really important. So ECO, the ECO program is educating children outdoors. At the Bethel Elementary School, we used to have our teachers go outside with us, but right now um, 
we don't have that happening. So there's two different programs that you can have. There's teachers going out with students, which helps the, the indoor learning come outside and the outdoor learning come inside. When you have just an eco teacher, um, which I am in the elementary school, it, you and an, an aide to go out with you, you lose a little bit of that integration, like that back and forth. Because you can imagine if the teacher goes outside, they can easily bring the learning back into the classroom and vice versa. They can bring indoor learning outside. So that's that's a big piece to remember. So staffing also for safety is um, you need two people. If you're the farther away you're going, you need two people. So that's really important. I emphasize that it's really important to have the, the teacher. Um, elementary programming. So this is what we do basically. This program builds resilience, of confidence, inspires learning, sparks lifelong connections with nature and um, necessary vitamin N. So we do fire skills, we learn how to work with tools, and do a lot of exploration of the natural world. While you're switching, safety is our biggest thing with the elementary school and then they don't even build a fire right away. They have to learn how to be respectful no. of the fire pit and all the rules. Um, so we also build self-confidence through working with, with their hands and with fire and with tools, um, integrating school and classroom topics, learn to ask questions and find answers on their, their own, and a lot of journaling and sit spots. Okay, next slide. Thank you. So this is an example of an activity with this is a preschool class um, to inspire learning and inquiry. Questions spark their learning and, and awareness of their environments. We are constantly asking them, what do you notice? What do you wonder? Um, what do you see? This, this is just an activity with learning about squirrels and resilience. Next slide. So like Bono was saying, community building, teamwork, and awareness are important for uh, big pieces of this program. We go with the ECO's three cares, which is care for yourself. And we teach the, explicitly teach the kids what these mean, um, caring for others and caring for the earth. So we constantly talk about what, what that is. We use a, a circle of power and respect, which is, um, if you can just go back one second to that slide, we use this in a middle school as well. We sit in circles with students so that everybody can see each other and take turns talking, listening, and speaking. Next slide. So these are our outdoor education learning goals. These move into the middle school. Yeah, everything that we do in the elementary school builds towards the middle school, and we carry forth all of these items that you see. One of So one of our questions themes of this year for our elementary focus is why are trees important? Why are they important for various ecosystems? We cover a bunch of science standards um, throughout the year, but this is one of them about ecosystem. And there are there are several others involved in teaching this these standards. Um, our teacher, myself as the outdoor educator, and the writing teachers are in each classroom are working together to help them understand why trees are important and more about ecosystems. That's just one example. And then they okay, carry so them. Go ahead. So these are just some ex pictures of what kids have been working on outside over the years, different um, confidence building skills. They build their own forts together. That's teamwork. They work on the confidence of using a saw safely and making their own paint with different materials. They learn how to um, also harvest different materials in a sustainable way. Okay, next slide. Learn how to use tools. Um, and like Bonna said, they, we go th through safety protocols um, thoroughly before, for a long time before they're able to use tools and they have permission slips so their parents know that they have permission that they can learn how to use different tools. These are uh, different projects they worked on. Next slide. Okay, 
Okay, so science, math, literature, art, music, and other subjects are incorporated into our outdoor experience throughout various hands-on learning projects. Um, so we had a kindergarten class working with m objects in motion. So that's on the right, those pictures. And then we were learning about different habitats of birds. Um, the middle pictures and, and uh, I think, oh, symmetry for art and some insect bodies for science on the left bottom there. Next. Oh, I forgot. Math and science, some more insect bodies and math games with outdoor uh, nature decks, sorry. Next slide. Just examples of journaling and sit spots. So things we learn about, they journal about and they come back and share. Next slide. Yeah. So winter, people are oftentimes afraid or don't do outdoor learning in the winter. And these, this is our students' favorite time. I don't know about well, they're learning to love it this year, but elementary loves to be up in the winter. And there's all kinds of learning. The same learning that you do in the spring and fall can happen in the winter. Next slide. Okay, fire skills, awareness, teamwork. First, cooking, fighting, science with fire. So things that we do outside, we are <clears throat> helping them love to learn. So they're still learning while they're out here and they're enjoying their time and they're enjoying to be challenged by, you know, having, having something like fire that they have to pay attention to and they have to be able to start. Um, and we're constantly talking about other things while we're sitting around the fire so we can have questions that have to do with science or um, English, whatever's going on in the world. Okay, next slide. Uh -huh. Thank you. Hi. We're gonna jump into the middle school here. Um, you folks, as far as I understand, are elementary, correct? Somebody know? Right. Yep. And this is the direction that we take kids through after the elementary. I just thought you should take a look at what what we're going towards. And we're taking all those concepts and principles that we start with, with the elementary kids and build on them and build skills. Um, and they, the what we just came to my mind a lot is that they have some, learned respect and they have learned caring and they have learned conscientiousness. And it shows with the kids who've had eco already and it's a lot easier for the older kids if they've had some background in all of these concepts to be able to move forward um, more smoothly into the next skill levels. And these are the skill levels. I hope you're browsing through them. We work with the natural world. I'm just gonna skim because we don't have time, but you'll get this later. Um, safety of course is still huge and they still need to stay in sight of me and the other teachers and in earshot, even if they can range a little bit further, um, they know about sticks and fire safety and how to build fires. They spend a lot of time building fires. They love it. And they don't use matches and they don't use paper. They use fluff and they use flint and steel. And we'll get, be getting into bow drills once the weather's a little drier. They use natural materials that are out there. Um, we've been fortunate to have shop wood for when it's really lousy. They've been learning how to make fuzz sticks out of that. So they've been learning tools, how to use tools and how to respect tools and what to do with tools and always never leave them on the on the ground or on a table they're always put away etc cetera, etc cetera. they learn all of these things and it's it's drilled into them really because you have to do it and it's just part of their life now i feel like they're a lot safer than they were when they came to me um they connecting to the school subjects it's wonderful working with our pods so that we can do both together um, they are learning leadership and leaders just naturally come to the front when we're experiencing all these other activities, whether it's a hike or whether we're working in small groups at the fire pits or um, cooking or learning other activities. So it's good, it's all good. Um, we start the year with tools and with knots 
here they are moving along to just so you can see some pictures. The one on the left is when we were building the trail. We built an inner loop and the kids actually did it in seventh and eighth grade. Those were seventh graders then. Um, and they made the le lower left is one of the maps that was that's half of the the trail that they built. And they we did compasses and learned how to make maps and use maps. And so it's a lot of a lot of skill building here. Um, right. Anna, I'm going to interrupt you. Um, go. Just just for time, because I think questions are the key. But mm -hmm. uh, before we move into questions, I want to check in with the chair and with yeah. the superintendent. Are there any pieces of this that you want more on right away, or should we open it up to questions? Um, I think the way. Well, I'm a little. Then I'm. I'm a little. I mean, I'm an instinctual supporter of this of this idea and this program. I guess my big concern, and this is sort of some of the feedback we've already gotten is um, how do academics uh, fit into this? How does literacy and mathematics, I mean, for me, it's instinctual that it does, but we need to be able to explain this to people. Um, and the example that was used um, very clearly, I thought, why, by one of our parents was, what if I want um, a regular school education? You know, what if I want my kids to be in a classroom getting a regular school education? And what do you say to someone like that? You know, obviously, obviously the personal, social, emotional stuff, that's clear. But we're talking about, okay, does this improve math skills? Does this improve literacy skills? Mm -hmm. um, what are the numbers that are gonna support that argument? Um, is this co comprehensive in the sense that it takes care of all, of all of the subjects that happen in a school day? Is this a way to do them outside or is this something that's separate sort of like our enrichment block. I think that's the biggest question I need to get answered so I can support this when I sell it to our, our, our public. I think Melissa yeah. might be a good person to start with the answer on that and I'm happy to backfill. And there's also some resources around the state, Ethan, North mm -hmm. Branch Nature Center. I put their uh, website link in the yeah, chat. I know about them. I know of them. And we also at the middle school are using the Junior Main Guides curriculum which has uh, pretty strong uh, standards also, and everything connects, as you would imagine, to transferable skills. But Melissa, can you talk a little bit about some of the ac traditional academic connections? Sure. Sure. Um, so n none of this takes away the time of literacy or math. So we've, I think in the elementary, we have about two hours for every student, every class in a week. So. Um, they still every day they get their math and, and their literacy blocks. Their science it, but, as well. <laughs> I'm sorry. Say that again. Uh, in, in the inside the inside classroom or outside? The inside a classroom. Oh, inside okay. a classroom. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. And so the way we've worked the schedule is um, this year it it takes place at the same time that essentials would take place. What what I think what <laughs> what should be happening is that teachers go out with the eco teachers so that they can easily integrate what they're learning inside the classroom outside and then vice versa. What we do this year is that we can't fit that in because of scheduling. But if you were to create this program, um, I emphasize that that really important because then to answer your question the teacher knows more about like what they're learning in math and what they're learning in literacy and they can help um, integrate the two seamlessly I think that and now we're having like meetings in the hallway and on the fly so like we can integrate this but it works a lot smoother smoothly sorry if the teacher is a part of their experience outside. is that yeah. Oh, and you had follow up? Uh, no, let's, uh, I'm okay. I think I could just say a lot of what Melissa just said. There's, but you can, you should and could build the model you want and need with the resources you have. Mm -hmm. So it's about in how, how much you integrate with the teacher. Ideal is full integration or at least the teacher coming outside with you, maybe a one day a week, two days a week, something like that, or at least familiar with what you're doing. And then the, the fullest level would be full integration. We have a teacher here at, um, um, at, at Rochester who really believes in full integration 
she's got letter cards, yeah. number cards, and she's outside doing that kind of stuff. So Amy, yeah. Amy has her hand up. Yeah, I see that. Let's go. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to run your meeting, Ethan. <laughs> um, That's, comes with great. I, I just wanted to clarify because you kind of cut out a little bit. You you said that each group goes into the eco classroom for two uh, two hours a week. Is that what it is? So it's not yeah about an hour and a half to two hours. Okay, so it's not an every day that they're out there. On um, okay. There this is the piece though, Amy yeah. and Ethan and everyone, you can build your own model. Right. There are some schools that do a full day outside. There's some schools that do a half day outside. There's some schools that do two hours. We're doing the two hours. There's some schools that do co-teaching basically, somebody like Melissa or Bonna with a traditional classroom teacher and they mm -hmm. plan it together and they integrate it. And then there's some ways that you can treat it like a special and we, we're learning how to do this, and we encourage you to learn how to do it with us. Mm -hmm. It's really lovely because you can build the program that suits the needs of your kids, your families, your teachers, and the resources you have. Great. Let's go through uh, questions. Carl had his hand up, and then we'll get to you, Megan. Um, yeah, what I'm curious about, Owen, is what i'm seeing is a lot of like you know there's that 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 video of the, the the swiss outdoor kindergarten program where it's going outside and using nature as a classroom what i'm wondering about because one of the things that in various times we've tried to integrate in stockbridge you know part of the outdoor education is much you know, has more of an agricultural focus it's around wellness and foods and gardening and relating to plants and say doing a science lesson versus you know around you know seedlings and gardening and food food mm -hmm. science and kind of you know closing the loop that way versus just and I, I i'm sorry i shouldn't say the word just versus what it seems to be the idea of you know having ex an, an experiential outdoor classroom that translates traditional educational concepts you know via an outdoor lens mm -hmm. what i'm wondering is number one do you guys do any of that, you know, agricultural gardening, um, you know, interact, you know, interacting with the outdoors as part of your program? And it just wasn't part of this short presentation. And, you know, number two, where do you, you know, do you, as we look at families and, and, and people getting away from that traditional model of, you know, a K through 12 education sends you to college, but it might send you to trades or to the land or whatever. Can we be especially, I guess it doesn't matter for us what you guys are doing in the middle school program because we don't have a middle school. But again, you know, given that you might want our kids to join your middle school program, but is there that integration around the idea of not just the wandering landscape, but the working landscape? Absolutely. We don't have a formal program like that, but we are walking all around that and talking about it. And I know Jamie has great interest in that. And not just at Rudd, but as a way, because it's a way of life in Vermont, right? There's the hippies and the farmers. And actually, I know one guy that's a hippie and a farmer. But, you know, the, the thing, we do want your middle school students, by the way, but more than anything, <laughs> we want, well, we want them to want us. We're trying to build the most dynamic programming we can. And okay. part of that is this. I This is the third school where I've started an outdoor ed program. And... One of the the one at Twinfield when I started that we did a full day outside once a week, twenty percent of their learning, and there was a lot of resistance because if you take twenty percent of a traditional learning away, it really does change everything. So you have to be committed to this in a way that works for you all. I would recommend starting slow, building up, learning from others, and starting to get together with the Melissas and the Bonas and the Megs, there's lots of good people doing this work. And, and what a lovely thing that's going on. And we're teaching a lot about the earth, but we're teaching those transferable skills, problem solving, teamwork, self-reliance, being alone in the woods for three minutes by yourself quietly. Oh, I have referred to this, by the way, sometimes as hippie scouts, because it's sort of like Boy Scouts in like farm and wilderness, but it really is lovely 
and the kids love school. One of the kids in the middle school the, earlier this fall said, I'm not sure which two days I like best, the two days we go to the woods or the weekend. I think we're <laughs> doing it right when that happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think I, I think this is great. I think that, you know, one of our, you know, one of our advantages of where we are, we talk about our declining uh, population, all that. We talk about the negatives. Our positives are, are our environment, where we're raising these kids and what we can do to give them a holistic and whole education that's not just standardized, standardized tests and computers. And I'm an IT guy in education. So, you know, I, please don't, 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 don't take my criticism, but I, I you know, as, as being against it, I just would like us to, I think it's important that we, that we, that we, you know, we honor Vermont's working landscapes as well as our wandering landscapes. Agreed. 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 Good. Megan. Hey, thank you, Carl. That is right on. I totally agree about, you know, having the integration of farming as well as just, you know, a wonderment and um, learning outside period. Uh, we have a wonderful program that starts in our kindergarten at Rochester that my child is now in the fourth grade and she talks still about that every single day. And she wishes, one of our biggest challenges at our school is how to get it beyond kindergarten because we do have, we, you know, test scores are a struggle. We have teachers that want to dedicate themselves to literacy and mathematics and find that struggle and sometimes just the uncomfortableness of them not being, you know, confident in taking kids outside. So I, I, I we've yeah. had a hard time taking an amazing program at Rochester for kindergarten and being able to get it integrated to every grade. And I guess mm -hmm. our budget is also a factor of being able to hire an extra person because um, it does come at the expense of others. Um, so I guess just like how successful have you guys been at getting your teachers out there and getting them to lead these classes? Thank you. Melissa can do this. Can I take that? So yeah, yeah Owen and I know the first year that we did this, what, five years ago, it, we had had maybe two teachers really gung-ho about it and took the eco course and so that was great but it took us a couple years to get everybody on board and it just took them being out there and having someone right there holding their hand which was me and having another person and seeing for themselves like this is, we can do this we can integrate the, the learning and now what we have is Teachers email me. We, we don't have a lot of time to, to meet like we used to have, but they're emailing me. Okay, this is what we have to to learn in science or math or writing. And how can can you help integrate this outside? And then I'll take it and brainstorm. And we're meeting in the hallway. I mean, they're completely in because they see that it motivates students to learn, and they see that it works. So it just takes time, but it does take that a little bit of hand holding because you really don't want to just throw people out there that are fearful or don't have that confidence so or it just becomes so I you know, add to that is the staff training giving the staff opportunities to work with an eco person um, to get more comfortable, get more familiar, so that it takes away a lot of the stress for them because they're already have one leg in. Whereas a lot of it, it's made a huge difference in the middle school. I have to say that nice. to individuals, teachers, and all the teachers who were teaching outside until November nonstop, that it was remarkable, and they they still love it. So um, we took advantage of the pandemic in that way. I can tell you, I can't encourage you enough to call North Branch Nature Center. They just got a mega grant and to start up in schools. And they will send a consultant. You may have to put some money in, but they will send a consultant for a year to if any of your teachers take the summer long class. It's also offered credit through Castleton and it's based in the woods. It's five days. It's in Montpelier and it's a lovely experience. I think Melissa's had it and Bonna, have you gone to it? Mm -hmm. No, but I take I took my biodiversity course up there with the same people. Yeah. So um, it's even just have the conversation with them. And I don't know what they're doing with their grant money, but it's I am never shy to ask for that stuff. And just I'm happy to talk to Amy Butler, who's their lead educator, if you want. 
Um, oh, and one quick thing. You just totally garbled with me. It was like, place. What was the name of the, the North something? I'll ungargle it for $1,500. <laughs> it's North Branch Nature Center, and I put it in the chat also. Um, I, I want to make sure. Uh, Jenny, do you have any questions for them? Um, I guess the only thing that sounds really interesting, I think you guys did a really good job covering it. Um, I guess a two quick questions you mentioned the two hours is that the same amount of time from elementary school through high school and i was also wondering um as students get into middle school and high school and have more flexibility with being able to choose their courses is this something that that all students do or is this like an optional um program we were going to be in the high school this year and the pandemic came and so I've not gone to the high school yet to start it but they were ready to do that with one day uh, four days a week for an hour each afternoon is how they were going to set us up with this for the middle school we're doing um, essentials and we have an hour and a half to two and a half hours with the kids um, outside that's um, this year in a pandemic but usually what? it's only four an hour, Usually right? it's one hour a day for um, five days a week for, with a but, certain group, and then we rotate groups. Is how we. I have a vision. I also have a vision of this as being an option, a flexible pathway. So if there's a a kid that really wants to thrive outdoors and their parents are supportive of that, is there a way that we can get them a full day, a half day, a full week? Mm -hmm. I know of some kids, high school graduates, that have done this and have gone on to successful programs outside of um, traditional, you know, like liberal arts schools. So we're wide open. I think the older we get with kids, we still offer the skill building stuff. And you'll see the June main, main guide stuff in the chat as well. But we also need to be open to the kids personalizing this. So, but the first thing we do is safety, safety, safety. Um, and um, I think everybody's had a question in now. Um, Amy, did you get a question in? She, oh, did. she might be gone. Okay. I'm good. Uh, I'm good. Thank you. This has all been wonderful to hear. Um, um, I'm one thing useful for me, Owen. Um, does your school board have a policy about this? No. We're, okay. We really, that's one of the things we really want to try and craft a policy statement about this. And we're going to put together so that the administration has a clear guideline for how it should be implemented. Um, and um, I would welcome any suggestions or even just um, off the top of your head notions, um, probably not in the detail you gave us tonight, but just some broad you know, strokes of, this is why we believe in this, this is what it should look like in general, um, this, you know, something like that. So if you can even just send an email to me, you know, the, the wrsvu.org, Address yep. Owen. I would love that so that we can start putting together a policy because I, I, I felt like we we keep saying, hey, get those kids outside, get those kids outside, without really knowing what we're saying. Mm -hmm. And I think I think it's much better for our administration and the teachers if we have a really clear policy that says this is why we believe in this and this is why it's good. And also for the parents, obviously, who some of them don't want their kids outside. Um, I see. Uh, I know Carl has his hand up, but I could respond to that. I don't know if Carl wants to add to your statement. No, go go ahead, Owen. I, my first impression, Ethan, is no policy. I don't think it's, and don't be offended, please. I don't think it's proper for a school board to be writing curriculum policy, if you will, like what should be taught and shouldn't. I get. I think what you're saying is we want this and it's good, and we we want to support it and protect it. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe a statement from the board. And I don't know. I'll look to Jamie on this. I, I think policy is usually, you know, seen in my mind as like school laws. And if you make outdoor education a school law and something changes dramatically, I, I would think that you might be boxed in on it. I'm not sure, though. That's my first reaction. I do think that setting a goal around it is very important and key. Actually, my, my comment was going to be pretty much a lot of what Owen said is that it's not, I don't think it's appropriate for the board to have a policy. What the board does have is 
the administration is, is supposed to present that annual curriculum kind of plan and the, the board making a, a formal statement to the administration saying that they want to see the next curriculum plan having, you know, X level of, 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 of outdoor component would be, or, or a level of outdoor component would be the way to do it. Much like we said, it was the board's intention to bring in world languages and we, we, we wandered around, we found a way to do that, that the administration supported and the budget could afford and all that. We kind of put out a, a general guiding statement and, and let people bring something back to us. I think that curriculum, that annual curriculum review and making a statement about what we would want to see from the administration and that would be the appropriate board place to put that. Um, and I could be wrong, so please, Jamie or well, Bonnie, I, correct me gently. Yeah, I, I mean, I, our policy and our mission statement are so broad as to be almost pointless to some extent. Um, I, I saw it very much as a guideline, not as a rule. When I think of a policy, I want to say, I want to make it as clear as possible that I think this is a really good idea and, and that I want our administration to be making it a priority and our teachers to be making it a priority. And I, I think sometimes the administration doesn't always get the support. Anyway, this is a discussion for us to have and not for you to take your time up. Uh, good. Are there any further questions with um, our, our presenters here? Anyone else? We would love to have you come visit if we could do it safely. Absolutely. Well, that's, that's coming, hopefully, with vaccines. Good. Well, we want to thank you very much for coming. This was an excellent introduction to this whole program and uh, much, much appreciated. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks, guys. Yep. So, you know, as I think about it, I think about our continuous improvement plan and how this could clearly integrate with personalized learning and pathways yes. to say that, that we are going to ensure that there's an experiential pathway for mm -hmm. students and that we're going to engage all students in it universally so that they have the skills and understanding if that's something they want to pursue as they get older. Um, what Owen said is certainly my dream that a student could have this be a pathway and they're demonstrating proficiency through outdoor and experiential ed. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a way, Ethan, for us to really capture it in a, in a solid way through that number two goal around personalized learning that's specific to your continuous improvement plan at our sub. Cool. Great. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Be well. Hey, thank you. All right. The academic data report, January Universal Assessment. Principals will present their academic achievement data in both math and reading. I didn't mean to cut that off. We could also talk more, but I think let's keep this on the agenda for next meeting too. And, um, and keep talking. I, about just, I want to add a takeaway that yes. is very key to me, especially as I start to think of both campuses next year and how we're building this and vision. I think this is really important. I think this is happening in a lot of science classes on both campuses already, but we need to walk before we sprint with this. Like we are by no means ready to do like full day, any of that. Oh. Like I was at Bethel when Melissa first started. And in fact, she was my neighbor. Like we taught next door to each other. And um, I can remember how hard she worked just taking the kids out and how much time that took. And then slowly teachers started to join. And just like that's how we implement literacy programs or curriculum in mathematics, I think it's important that we keep that in mind that we are, there are some teachers that are ready for the full day experience. <laughs> there's no doubt about it, but there's also, we have to educate staff as much as we educate kids. And the first example or way to do that right now off the top of my head is to start in the manner we intend it to be of like every kid gets access to it one time a day during a normal special for 45 minutes. And then that person is working with teachers in other ways for it to be part of their science program. But that's just me spitballing. But I just want us to remember what we saw was a five year end result tonight of how hard they've worked at it. So we just aren't there yet. 
And I just, I want us desperately to race there, but it's not fair to kids or teachers to go too fast and not do this the right way. Well, that, that said, I also, I also believe that it's important to keep encouragement up to teachers because I think it's very easy sometimes to sit back a little bit on something like this. And this is where I, you know, this is my personal opinion, but I just feel like keeping a, a consistent, this is what, this is what we want. This is what we want. This is what we want. Um, um, not that it happens fast, but that, that teachers know that this is what we want. No. Yeah. I think I've got a strategy to ensure that there's progress monitoring of this goal. And right. I think it needs to be incorporated as part of the principal's reports under goal two. Okay. So you're getting a monthly report on the progress we're making toward this end. Oh. Yeah, because it hasn't been a clear thing in terms of what exactly, obviously COVID was the, the, the big priority, making sure they're outside a lot. Our kids have a lot of experience of being outside. Now maybe that was just sledding, but the fact is they have a lot of experience being outside. And I, I would hate to lose that um, some of that momentum because COVID suddenly, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're safer, safer again. Um, Cause I think we've gotten, we gained a lot through COVID activities outside. Megan, you still want to say something? Um, just really quickly, um, just about, I've given it some thought about, you know, attracting uh, when we are hiring new candidates for positions that become open, that maybe we can put that into, um, you know, the application process, as well as possibly looking into doing some different advertising in terms of maybe not just like school spring, but also, you know, doing local, the mountain times, Killington has a lot of, you know, recreational people, just kind of like thinking outside of the box in terms of um, when people are applying to our positions and just kind of letting, and like maybe where we're focusing on where we're pulling some of our candidates from. That's just a suggestion. Thank you. Good. Yes, I recall. All right, let's move on. Um, so if you look at, we'll start with the reading. So I just wanna be clear and a point of emphasis because Bonnie and I went back and forth with this. When we say winter 2020, we are talking about data from last winter before we shut down. So last school year. So your comparison, just so you have that point of reference, because that was a um, conversation Bonnie and I had in circles of each other uh, the other day when we were working on this together. So I just wanna be clear to folks that that winter 2020 data was taken, uh, was collected December, January, last school year. And then fall 2020 was when we came back in the fall of this current school year. And then winter 2021 data is data from this current school year just recently um, completed. So I know sometimes school years and calendar years overlap in weird ways. So I just wanted to make sure that we pointed that out before we got too far. Um, so I just in reading alone, you'll see quite a, um, quite a jump, uh, specifically EIS, which is our benchmark assessment system. So it's where kids sit and read one-on-one -on -one and they're assessed on their fluency, their comprehension skills um, is the summary of that. Cause I know that's probably an acronym that folks don't know. Um, so you'll notice in our K2, in our primary grades, you know, it's a 20% it's a increase of those kids that are proficient from the beginning of the year, but more accurately before we shut down, there's a 10% increase. So we're seeing lots of growth in those kids. And I also would say, you know, it's promising. It's showing that the work we're doing around literacy is increasing. Um, and you even see that and that we're starting to make, you know, uh, gains in those areas. Um, and then in three grades, three to six, uh, we're still, you know, it, there's no regression, I guess, is what I would say, which is exciting. I think there's a big concern about that right now because of how we've gone in and out of in-person learning and virtual learning. And um, so it's exciting to see that we're making progress uh, and we don't see like significant areas of regression or change. 
so that's reading. Amy, did you have a question about the reading? And then I'll go to Matt. Yeah, I did. I, I, um, you were saying that, um, so like the three to six, they were mm -hmm. in, before COVID, there was 79% proficient in the BAS. Um, then there was 64% proficient in the fall, but it actually has de decreased for the winter of proficient. So, so, so you do have to keep in mind that as small as our numbers are, that's as simple as potentially one oh. kiddo just barely missing it. So I would say of those in the three through six that are not proficient, there's not um, large concerning gaps of how far they're off. So they're making you. progress and they're making um, they're making a lot of gains. So it's good to see. So it, it's probably the difference of one kid is the honest mathematical answer. I see. Um, and then in terms of before we shut down, you also have to remember this is not necessarily comparing the same group of kids. Right. Because last year's third and sixth graders. So again, all it takes is like a group. Okay. To and move on. And I don't I, I don't want that to be like explaining why the answer because we want to shoot for what we had at last winter. Right. That's ideal. We want to be higher than that. That's what we're working towards maintaining. Okay. No, thank you. That that in clear understanding. So um the benchmark assessment is essentially the teacher sitting down and, and reading or uh, having them read directly to them. Whereas the star 360, is that a test they're taking on the computer? Right. Good question. It is a test on the computer. It focuses more on vocabulary, again, reading comprehension, like they're reading a small passage and having to answer out of it. There's some grammar usage and mechanics in there. There's all sorts of stuff. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jenny, and then we'll get to Bonnie. Yeah, I have two questions. So it sounds like the way you're talking is that the, the K through two group is larger than the three through six group. Is that correct? Uh, larger um, in well, terms of uh, means or like number of students? Sorry. Number of students, because you make it sound like the, um, the data of the three through six, the change could be one student. It sounds... It, sounded like um, I would say we've closed more gaps with our K through two okay in the primary grades this school year so far not necessarily okay. for a larger data collection point oh, okay you were saying the one student so I was thinking that um, no, no, you know, no, one no. student would be a, a higher percentage of students than the than the K through two but um, I misinterpreted Perfect. And just so for I just jump in, Lindy, just yeah. to try to clarify. So I would say that in your set of data population, a 10% swing either way is something to start to take note. Um, and so what I think Lindy was trying to say is that you went from 28% proficient in the fall up to 48. So that's a 20% gain. So that's enough yeah. of a gain to say, all right, we're headed in the right direction with our rate of growth. So you know, there was a 4% change in the fall to the winter in your three through six. Statistically, that's not that's not a big change. Now, would we like to see the same growth that we saw in K through two? Absolutely. What I'm hearing from Lindy is, is she's saying there's a lot of kids on the cusp of being proficient in the benchmark assessment. So the hope would be you're gonna see a big swing through over the next three months as we continue to close the achievement gaps. The yeah. other thing with the benchmark assessment is as you move up the grade levels, it gets more complex and it's it's harder to move up to the next text level in regards to meeting the standard at, as compared to in the primary grades, you can start to go through text levels fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Sorry, Lindy, I just wanted the board to have that context. No, 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 that's great. I appreciate it. And then two questions. Um, First one, is it typical for the STAR 360 to have um, significant difference in results from the benchmark assessment? Yes, because it assesses different areas. Okay. Uh, right, Jamie and Bonnie, I'm looking for. Yeah, I mean, what no. I would, what I'd let you know, Jenny, is that um, the STAR 360 really focuses on fluency um, and close reading. So, 
a student reading complex text, being able to comprehend complex text, and then be able to, within the moment, apply what they comprehended. Where in the Fountas and Pinnell benchmark assessment, you read an entire book, and then the teacher asks you some comprehension questions. I would say that the depth of those questions are not the same as the STAR 360 questions. So I think that, you know, how we utilize this data is about how do we inform instruction. So if your students are doing really well on the benchmark assessment, but struggling with STAR 360, then as an educator, I'm saying, I need to get my students into more nonfiction texts, close reading, and trying to up vocabulary because that's probably what's getting in the way. And so that's why both of these assessments are important, but that's why we need to analyze the data because what we should be doing with this data is using it to inform instruction. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm looking for our teachers to be doing with their principals at that building level when they're seeing those discrepancies. Great, thank you. And then my last question, just to confirm that both of the, the STAR 360 and the benchmark includes the virtual as well. Yes, STAR 360 does, uh, the benchmark doesn't, is the uh, slightly different given virtually, but it assesses in the same way, meaning it's just a different text at the same level um, because of what is accessed digitally. But yes, all the virtual kiddos are in there and assessed as well. Thank you. <clears throat> and I'm just going to repeat uh, something that Lindy said. Um, I don't want to explain away the results. In fact, I will say that um, we're working very, very hard because not enough of our youngsters are, are proficient. We, we really want every single one of our youngsters to be proficient. That being said, um, we have some really, really tiny groups in this data. For example, there's groups that are as small as four youngsters. So one child that either goes up or down could give you this great false sense of, wow, we've improved by 25% or we've dropped by 25%. And really we're only talking about one, one youngster. I think across both campuses, and Lindy, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we only have two cohorts <clears throat> that are 10, 10 or more. Everybody else, all of our other grade level groups are four, five, eight, and those are really, really tiny numbers to draw really any conclusions from. So we, we just have to be careful about how we look at that. And then Jenny, to one of your questions, one of the things I look at that helps me get a, a handle on our kiddos is I compare, um, I would agree with everything Jamie said about the two assessments, but I, off, I look at how did a youngster do on their baseline assessment in winter versus their baseline assessment at the end of the year. So instead of looking at 360 compared to baseline, I do it look at baseline compared to baseline and star 360 compared to star 360 because that way you're looking at comparing the same uh, sets of skills and types of activities. I don't know if that helps, but. Yes, it does. Thank you. Carl. Um, the question I would have, I mean, I, I, I was going to make the point that, that, that Bonnie made that um, because of our, you know, small population, you know, some of some of those indicators uh, move really, really radically. But the question I would want to know from from Bonnie and from Lindy is, given what you see in those test results, is our budget and is our plan giving you the tools you need to correct that? Are there things we need to change? Should we be, should we be hiring a math tutor? Should we be hiring an, uh, you know, a literacy tutor? Should we be having mandatory after school? I don't know. I, I, you know, what do you guys think? How do you take these numbers? So I see this success as those that are having, where students are having the most success is um, teachers who have implemented things with the most fidelity. They have taken every piece of information given to them from our literacy coaching and they have implemented it. Not offensive, not personally like, okay, this is gonna make me a stronger teacher. So for example, I met with a teacher yesterday and we poured over data together for an hour and a half. And she restructured using um, something that the literacy coach Amy Toth had given how she was changing her guided reading group or small group instruction. That's what 
I'm looking for is that's how we're using that data. We can see where we still need to make growth as well as the other piece of the puzzle is bringing the literacy interventionists to the table at the same time. So we're using shared language so it doesn't confuse kids and we're goal setting for kids. So in six weeks, we should be seeing this much progress in this kid. And this is how we're going to help this kid get there. And I think mm -hmm. that's um, a piece that Jamie has encouraged and asked us to do as instructional leaders that we haven't always done in the past. So that's how I see this data uh, and the, being helpful. And the, board, and, the only, and the board has given you all the tools to do that to, to, to the best of your ability. You don't need anything more from us. That, that's the part that I want to worry about. I think this is great. I'm really glad that we're drilling down into this, that we're looking at our kiddos uh -huh. and, and, and not because we want to improve test scores, but because we want better outcomes. Because I don't, I don't hear any of this conversation being about test scores. and I don't want it to be about test scores. But do you guys have everything from us you need to, to get the outcomes you want? I think one of the things I would add, I would add, Carl, I, I concur with everything that, that Lindy had said. Time is really a function. Time is one of the resources I think that most, uh, that most every, with which most every school struggles. So, um, and when you mentioned tutors and you mentioned interventionists, they all do great, great work. What our numbers say to me is that given the number of youngsters we have who aren't reaching those proficiency levels. And I agree with you. It's not about test scores. It's about is a child proficient and will a child be able to use reading, writing, and mathematics as tools for however they want to, they want to craft their future. But when we have as many youngsters who aren't proficient as we have, uh, we need to address what we call our tier one instruction. So, not hiring tutors and people to work with youngsters after they've started to, to, to fall back, but looking at our tier one instruction and saying, why isn't what we do in the classrooms with our classroom teachers having a positive effect on more youngsters? And we've come, uh, we've come a fair distance in literacy. The board's heard uh, the number of, uh, of materials that we've been able to buy, the professional development we've been able to do, we have to continue that effort. And when we, in a minute, explain our mathematics, uh, talk about our mathematics piece, you'll understand that we have a tremendous amount of work to do there also. So I would say we're not lacking anything that the board can give us. Um, we just need to look at what we're doing in our, in our tier one instruction, in our classroom teacher to student instruction. And we gotta look at the data and figure out what is it that we're doing that's efficient and what is it that we're doing that's not efficient? Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry effective, not efficient. And I, I just think that goes back to Echo Bonnie to a long-term plan to continue to supply funds for professional development and coaching and continue. Like it's not necessarily in hiring more tutors, but to make all of our instruction better, we need to invest in teachers to use Jamie's line that he uses frequently, which means professional development. Absolutely. Thank you. Jenny. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, when Lindy was talking, a, a light bulb went off in my head and just wanted to note that I can personally attest to, um, you know, teachers changing things around. Um, I see more of it as my daughter's doing the virtual schooling and um, for one of her classes, her, her schedule has changed a couple times this year. And um, I know the teacher personally, and, you know, she always explains what she's doing and um, you know, really seems like that's, that's really the reason behind it is to really um, think about how, how they can do it most efficiently and also kind of getting some kids to class that didn't quite seem to be that kind of thing. But other than that, um, just wanted to kind of throw in that, that personal acknowledgement that I've definitely seen throughout this year. Good. Thank you. Um, further, any further questions on literacy or can we move on to math? Let's do it. Um, so in our math pieces, um, I would say we've seen a little bit of a bump, which is great. We've seen some students make some gains, but not nearly enough. Um, and basically shows us that we haven't regressed 
but we definitely to go back to what bonnie just said really need to take the time to invest in having stronger universal or you know classroom instruction instruction of mathematics excuse me um and that's why we've started structuring our half days around professional development for staff um in mathematics and it's just going to continue to be a focal point and a point to start to roll out just the way we did with our literacy initiative to start making true gains yeah and one piece i think is important i i i, I want to state this really really clearly when we talk about our tier one instruction um needing to be strengthened it has nothing to do with teachers working hard teachers having their hearts in the right places teachers wanting all kids to do well we just need to we just need to focus on professional development that lets teachers understand there are more efficient ways of doing things than what we're doing at the moment jamie's been really clear about the fact that he expects all youngsters in our district to learn and be proficient and we just have to crawl around what it is that we do and what it is that we ask teachers to do that can be um, that can be uh, bulked up in terms of how well it meets the needs of of youngsters instructionally. And that that talks about you know vocabulary and strategies and materials and approaches, all those kinds of things. Carl first, then Amy. Um, same question as about ELA, Bonnie Math. Do we have? I mean, especially as you're you're our SU Math guru. Um, do we have the math tools? Is the board giving you everything that we need to support our kids so they can they can uh, you know be successful? Um, I'm hoping the answer is yes, but if it's not, please let us know. Well, I think it's our plan of how to leverage our grant funding for that upcoming year to make it a focal point. So we have that. And I think the other thing to emphasize is we're not continuing with this model where people do one day of professional development and then that's it. There's no follow through, there's no this. There's a continuous model of improvement and feedback and um, accountability around implementing those things as well. Yeah, and that's, I mean, and this is not an issue for now because it, it gets to professional development, but. Um, certainly some of the stuff in the equity policy, or I'm sorry, the anti-racism policy, um, talk about, you know, requiring professional development. So, you know, we're certainly going to need to be thinking about how we're going to manage that pot to include equity and math and literacy and all the things. And I'm sure we'll do it. We'll do it wonderfully, but, um, it's important to, you know, <laughs> Sometimes it, it, we, I, I think we have to be, be careful that we're not saying we're going to use this particular asset or pot for this thing because sometimes we want to say, well, it'll, it'll, it'll solve math literacy, it'll solve equity literacy, it'll solve literacy, liter, you know, equity. And we, we're, we're, we're spending the same resources in three places. But it sounds like y'all are really on top of this, and that is awesome. Mm -hmm. Amy? Uh, yes. The uh, top of the page where it says winter of 2019. That's a typo. It is for winter 2020. I just caught that too. I'm sorry about that. That was fast fingers over that's here. That's but you, yeah. literally, you literally can't believe the conversation we had, Amy, about is it winter 19 or is it winter 20? Is it winter 20 or should we put fall 20? What comes first? Like no idea. <laughs> it was yeah. like hour. Maybe we winter <laughs> FY. Well, yeah, I think that's why I got left because we were toying with FY. Oh, yeah. But anyways, it, no, it is the same timeline as what I explained before. So thank you. Thank Carl, you. one of the things I will say that I will just add add to your question in terms of, you know, have we not been given any tools? I, I or are there tools we haven't been given? Obviously we've been we've been given a lot of tools. One of, the, one of the tools I think we have to give, give teachers is a handle on the current research. There's been a lot of really good stuff that's come out the last five to six, seven years about how youngsters learn mathematics, about what strategies are more effective in helping youngsters develop their engagement, their love of math, their ability to think through mathematical situations. So I think that's one thing um, 
that we really have to uh, figure out a way to get out to teachers. And then the other thing I think we have to do is to dispel this myth that, um, Jenny, I'm going to pick on you because I know you're an engineer, that only there's only a certain few people who are born under the lucky star to understand mathematics. And they go on to be engineers and architects and yada, yada, yada. Um, most kids, given the right environment and the right instructional approaches, can become very, very strong in mathematics. We just have to, we just have to believe that when we, when we start putting our classroom environments together and when we start designing professional development for teachers. The goal is all these kids will do well in mathematics, not just a select few. I know one of the things that schools look at who are really, really uh, committed to this excellence in mathematics is they look at their junior and senior classes and they say, how many kids have taken an advanced math course out of our junior or senior class? And many of them, most of them, when they started to do that look, they had very few kids. So their goal is to every year increase the number of kids who are taking advanced mathematics. Not because there's anything magical about advanced mathematics, <clears throat> but because it demonstrates an ability of a, of a young adult to think abstractly and to problem solve which are two skills they're gonna need regardless of what future they choose for themselves. So those would be, those would be two things I would just add to, to your question. To go back into what I was saying then, I would love to see some, some <clears throat> programming that would integrate that kind of mathematical exploration and outdoor exploration. If we could find a way to tie those things together and make a curricular statement that said, we are going to show these particular proficiencies in math through these particular expressions in outdoor education. I think that would be super meaningful. I think that would be a thing that would drive families that have school choice to say, I want to come there because I want my kids to learn about life and about skills by walking through the woods. And I think that if we could put that curricular package together, there's grants and there's funding that would support us being able to, you know, develop these alternative ways to, to educate these, these, these skills in our kids in our particular blessed environment of outdoor classrooms. I mean, me, yeah, well, I, and I don't, we Bonnie. could jump in and be great. Yeah, and to be honest, I don't, I don't see that as being hard to do, but I'm going back to something Lindy said. You need to have the time to get teachers steeped in the understanding of both outdoor education and the mathematics they're trying to teach through outdoor education. That's, mm -hmm. that's the key right there. Let me just tell you, um, if I may, that I went to a very good elementary school that um, did uh, woodworking from kindergarten all the way through ninth grade. And there is no better, I don't think, skill involving mathematics and learning using a tape measure, cutting lines, geometry, all these things in a very, very practical way. And I have to say, it's one of the losses, you know, that I think that we don't have um, some sort of basic carpentry program. I mean, you know, as I said, we were doing it in kindergarten um, using saws and all that kind of thing. And it's just such a clear transfer between math and sort of outdoor stuff. Um, Jenny, I know Amy next, sorry. Sorry, I jumped in, but I did. No, sorry, I didn't mean to still have my hand raised. <laughs> oh, you didn't? Okay, uh, Jenny? It's not related to outdoor education, but I feel like one thing that Stockbridge does a lot of, um, I'm not sure if we really talked about it, is um, in terms of relating mathematics is with cooking. Um, uh, mm -hmm. I know at least in the older grades, I'm not sure about, well, I'm sure they probably do in the younger grades, but um, I know my daughter's teacher does does a lot with cooking and even, you know, bringing that into, you know, word problems and um, stuff like that. So really, you know, um, I think the biggest thing is, you know, making it fun, um, you know, relatable and stuff that, that they're going to use, you know, doing math without even realizing they're doing math, I think, um, makes it more fun for kids. So and I think there's like two components that, that are key here, right? Like there's the piece of them being engaged, whether it's outdoor education pieces, which I've seen teachers use really well with mathematics um, or cooking, whatever the case may be, but also the need for very explicit instruction. Like, like you mentioned, Ethan, you're talking to uh, the daughter of someone who teaches woodworking for a living. So 
trust me when I say I understand measurement better than I wish I did some days. But um, that's a very explicit form of instruction that happens. You phase that in, right? You don't just go to the saw to start cutting the what. Well, some folks do, but it doesn't work very well. Uh, so you, you have to step into that. And so some folks have started using, some teachers have started using different ways of implementing that hands-on approach to mathematics, which is essentially all ideas wrapped into one. And, but it also requires very explicit instruction. So students understand the connections we're assuming they will get as adults. But we have to be really, you know, we use it to teach fractions. I say we, uh, teachers use it to teach fractions. Um, all hands-on ways of doing things, not just stand and deliver the way some of us may have learned. Um, I'm not sure if somebody else had their hand up, but um, I, I wonder if there's anything to be gained. I mean, you, you have a lot of these kids might be going home and they're doing, you know, they're working on the snow machine or the four wheeler where there's mathematics, definitely and adjustment and wrenches and sizes and all these things. And, and I wonder how much teachers are engaging students to find out what their background, home background experience is and what possible areas there, because certainly there's a lot to be learned by, I mean, that's how I learned carpet was I just, I just watched and I saw people doing stuff. And I, same thing with, you know, I just watched people picking up stuff. And I just think I, I, I'm wondering, there's something where you're not having to train a teacher. You're just being aware of what the kid's bringing in with them already, the kind of knowledge they're bringing in with them that then you can translate a good teacher, a quick teacher, an innovative teacher can translate into, well, you know, that's just like what we're talking about here. Right. So, so I I'll, I'll just jump in. So Ethan, I think that's formative assessment. And so we use that to inform our instruction and that's what our teachers do. And then what I would say is the, the biggest concern I have around mathematics right now is any classroom you walk into have a different routine or approach to teach mathematics. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have a common approach right now like we do in our literacy block. And so I think the literacy data and the math data could just speak to that. So what we're looking to do is engage our teachers in deeper content area knowledge so they feel confident in teaching mathematics. Specifically in elementary school, mo I would say 80% of the elementary teachers I've ever interviewed or met with, they typically get into elementary education because they love to teach reading, literacy, in writing, that is their passion. And a lot of them have math phobia. What we're gonna be looking to do is, how do we increase their confidence and expertise to ensure that our students have clear concepts and milestones throughout each grade? And one of the curriculum downfalls we have right now in the SU as well, is we, we don't have it specified to you at the end of kindergarten, our school students are gonna know, understand, and do these things in math. At the end of second grade, they're gonna know and understand and do these things at the end of second. So that, that work and that foundation is what we're gonna start jumping on ASAP with this assistance of Bonnie. We have uh, some teachers throughout the SU that are very interested in mathematics that are gonna help be leaders in this. And I would look for part of Onda's job as we bring it on to Adams is how do we make certain that we're leveraging our professional development time across the SU strategically while also not overtaxing our educators because you can't do it all at once. And so we're gonna need to make certain we create momentum and keep momentum with literacy while also backfilling our expertise in math and ensuring that we're addressing the whole child socially, emotionally, um, and, and, and in regards to outdoor and experiential ed. So that's the work ahead. And that's, frankly, that's why you pay me the money you pay me and your principals and um, your other administrators is to coordinate all that. Quick question. Is there a Fontis and Pinnell for mathematics? Well, there are some good yeah. math programs. There, there are good, good math, math programs. That, uh, following up with Carl's question, I mean, is this something we should be looking for? Maybe, you know, maybe we can do it just with our homegrown, you know, sort of stuff. But is there, 
down the road in a couple of years, uh, a math program we should be bringing now, in. He, part of your federal, part of your revenue in the, in the CFG, the federal grants, is to purchase new materials for next year. Uh-huh. Because clearly we've seen some success with Fontas and Pinnell. I mean, whatever. Yeah, what, I, what I would say about that, Ethan, is that, as Jamie said, is a follow up to something he said. Most of our elementary teachers are more confident and have deeper skill levels in teaching literacy than, than mathematics. Uh, a couple of things you'll hear me say. Lindy's heard me say this a number of times. To take Jenny's example of cooking, your example of woodworking or, or tearing down the snowmobile. I don't think you can, I don't believe you can teach mathematics. You can lead youngsters to discover mathematics and they can build on their discoveries. I don't believe you can teach them. If we teach mathematics, then all we're asking kids to do for the most part is memorize some formulas and some rules and this and that. How many of us remember how to find the volume of a cylinder? Probably not many of us. Um, what we want to do with this mathematics initiative is to really help teachers understand this is how you kindle this fire for understanding. That's all mathematics is, wanting to make sense and understand something, wanting to make sense out of and understand something. So whether it's cooking or woodwork or building a fort or there's, there's all kinds of mathematics in those activities, but you have to know your mathematics and you have to be comfortable with youngsters doing hands-on learning. That's sort of the challenge for us in the first year or two of this math initiative um, that we're hoping to take on. Carl? Um, I, I think that my, my, I raised my hand because what I'm concerned about is you know, are we, is our professional development around these things, you know, uh, uh, chasing the worst, worst um, statistic or is it, you know, uh, do we have a plan that's, you know, more holistic to, to help these kids, you know, you know, figure stuff out because, I mean, you know, Bonnie's comment of the volume of, 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 of a cylinder, it's the it's it, it's pi r squared times the height, says nerd boy, because I was the dorky kid that was a math kid. And I understand that our, our thinking is that we need to encourage kids to, you know, learn things in a practical environment. But what I'm worried about is that finding that link between this is what we want to do in a perfect world. And this is what we can actually do with our resources and the budget and what we have today. I think about how we talked about, like, a, a, as we said earlier, our biggest point about the merger was, you know, it'd be, well, would save, it would be the tax breaks. And we, we've proven that part, but it was also world language and it's taken a long time to figure out how to integrate that. And what, I, what I'm interested in us understanding or thinking about is how do we figure out when we identify these problems, ways that we can, you know, a pathway to, to, to affordably implement, implement them. So, Carl, I would just say that's how do we best leverage our federal grant. And so that, that's part of why we restructured at the SU was to ensure that we had the money in Title II for coaching in PD, and then also in Title I to fund supplies and, um, you know, make certain we're funding our interventionists appropriately. And one of the focuses within the grant will be mathematics, which hadn't been a focus prior within our strategies. So I, I'm hoping that we can leverage our grant funds and then the incoming ESSER two funds to accomplish a great deal of this work without it falling on the local tax base. Okay. And it's not going to be balancing mathematics against social emotional learning because our kids as you know, be all. the president, or as the president, as the governor, the governor of Vermont was saying, are in a not good shape. Yeah, and luckily a lot of our kids have been back. So I think when we look at our recovery plan, we'll see 
that we're a bit ahead of the curve because we've had most of our students back five days a week. I was amazed to see that 20% of students still haven't even stepped in the classroom yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that scared me too. Thank you for uh, your work on getting everyone in, into school, by the way. Yeah. Are we ready to move on? I think we're good. And Jenny, you good? I'm good. And Amy? Amy? Good. Megan? Still there, Megan? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Yep. Great. Thank you very much, uh, staff administrators. Appreciate it. Let us move on here. Sorry, I've got too many screens going. All right. Rochester High School building. Um, this is pretty quick uh, with no David. We are waiting on one of butter information from one of butter uh, address, which hopefully I might get tonight if I have the right email address. Um, uh, before we submit both, I think the wastewater has been submitted, Jamie, is that correct? And the subdivision is all just waiting on this one address for the final um, plan to be put in. Uh, well, the next step, obviously, we need to talk about, we need to talk about a um, uh, listing. You know, that's going to be something we need to get into as far as uh, figuring out how we how we advertise this property. If we, we are, do seriously intend to do that, um, which I think we should. Um, but uh, let's let's you know, that that's that's not on our agenda for tonight, but that's sort of the news so far. Amy, you want to say something? Go for it. Yep. I was just wondering um, if we should start uh, doing an inventory of um, items in the high school that, um, you know, we expect to retain um, at, at any property transfer and um, what we expect to, to let go or, you know, what we would like to sell in, in the meantime. Um, I think, yeah, what do we have for inventory lists yet? I mean, I've never seen one. Uh, it seems like could we have custodial staff start to do that, you know, an hour a day, start making a list of what's in every classroom, um, everything that's a saleable asset. Is that, is that possible? Is that how this should be handled? Uh, I think some of it has, I, I just have to think through strategy a little bit and Bonnie and I need to talk about that together in terms of, okay. that sounds like a good idea in terms of someone's use of time. I just have to think about that more logistically in terms of making sure we're cleaning and things like that as well. Um, some of it has been started, like I'll give Ray and Larry lots of credit because they have inventoried quite a bit of, you know, e-waste items versus tech items and things of that nature. So that's definitely moving in the right direction. We have, can we, it'd be great if we could start seeing those lists because well, I, I Sorry, the e-waste list is, is the fun list that's been circulated right now, um, meaning things that aren't functioning at all and are unusable. And maybe Ray has better technical terms than I do on what e-waste is. But, um, and the I do know that the library, the high school library has been open to this was obviously pre-COVID, but local librarians from all over, meaning public libraries, had the opportunity to come in and look through and take uh, what was good. And then we have, um, so now that's kind of at a point that what's left there has been left there. Like there's no local resource that would like to access those books. So we're talking the, about dumpster time. Probably. Uh, dumpster time. There's also a Follette, which is a company we use to purchase books for our library is interested in coming and doing an inventory and they will box up what they can take and give us cash for it as well as sell some things as consignment. And then what they can't take. Yes, you are right about the dumpster. <laughs> We're probably headed towards the dumpster after that point. Um, is it possible that by our next meeting, April meeting, we could, um, could have a inventory list to be looking at so that we can make some decisions? Uh, of the library or of the whole building? Whole building. 
I mean, obviously, this is this is a next we step. Can, we, I'm, I, I'm just we can have it started. That's what, I, I don't yeah, want no, to commit to the whole I, we, I, I just I want to be honest that yeah, the odds no, we, we of all to, of it being inventory by April are probably. But you're no, right. No, no, I'm saying how much? How much? How much? And uh, I think it's because it is it is absolutely as Amy's pointing out. Uh, this is a next step, no matter what we do, whether it's going to the town or whether we're going to sell this building. Um, we need to know what's inside it. And we need to make decisions about that. Amy? Yeah. Oh, your hand's still. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Oh, oh, go ahead. Okay. Sorry. Um, is the board, is the board feel good about, um, that we'd like to see wherever that list is. Ray, do you have something to add to this? about what you found in there? Oh, kind of. I mean, um, for example, just this week, uh, EC Fiber uh, determined that it would cost a couple hundred dollars to get access to the elementary school building. So that's a uh, merger expense and will be covered by that. But there are other services that, um, depending on who takes over the building, we may or may not be able to easily split fire, heat, telephone, things like that. All, all involved conversations. Yeah. Um, well, so we, yeah, we definitely need to not let this uh, wait too long. Uh, what's the next step for you, Ray? Can you give us a list or is that something for your friend, Jamie, who comes down to give us a list of, I mean, we need, we need a spreadsheet of, this whole process, because we've been so focused on the engineering part and the surveying part, but this has been a big Yeah, part. I mean, so what I would do is I'm going to reach out to Lyle. It's not the first school that's been liquidated and say, yeah. what have other districts done to liquidate their assets? And there's got to be some, my sense is there's probably some folks that do that and come in and inventory and then say, this is what you could get for these. We could sell them. Um, and here's, here's what you would gain for revenue. And so I would, I'll look to Lyle to say, what have other schools districts done to liquidate their assets? And how's the best way of God going about that? Good. Like and my that. sense is there's companies that can do this inventory for us and it's not even gonna cost us to have our employees do it. Okay. And I'm very interested in that. Well, no, I, I, I just think, yeah, I think it's, Amy, very glad you brought this up because I think it's absolutely the next step. Um, we should be active on um, so that we're prepared for whatever the eventuality is of this building. Um, and we've taken care of the outside. Now it's time to take care of the inside. Um, so can you, the administration and Jamie, have something for us by our next meeting? Yeah, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to have Lyle on your agenda anyway, because I want to bring in um, Lyle and the gentleman that I talked to you about, uh, talked to the Stockbridge community about in regards to best maximizing ESSER two funds and um, efficiency Vermont funds and finding efficiencies within the building at the elementary level and how we might be able to do significant work and upgrades to that building without additional costs to the tax base. So I was gonna have him at your next meeting anyways, but I will add this topic to the agenda in addition to that and that said if we could have um a, a, just a piece of paper ray even with what you just told us that this is this two hundred dollars this unknown cost this unknown cost this unknown cost uh it, lindy we've assessed these are the things we do know that are in there library books this is in other words let's start a running list of inventory and then we can add to it as it grows as we know more um, because there may be some things in there that somebody just goes bing that don't touch that or something like that but we just it's just part of our process here yep good uh carl i think you had your hand up a while back sorry no worries um i i dropped from my laptop so on my phone do you hear me yes okay yeah no my my thinking is that organizing and figuring out how we can best, I mean, it's going to benefit both the town of Rochester and, you know, the district, you know, organizing how best to dispose of the assets. I, 
someone had said, I think it was Jamie, you know, that lockers, for example, are a huge thing that people want or don't want. And, you know, understanding how to do that. I think that moving forward with really drilling into these details, because regardless of whether we're using the high school building next year or not, or whether we've disposed of it, we can dispose of the lockers or things that are assets, figuring out what those things are and being proactive and then being able to tell our taxpayers what we're going to be able to gain in terms of revenue of revenue by disposing of these unused assets is important. Oh, good. All right, I think we've I think we've covered that. Thank you very much, Amy, for bringing that up. Uh, I think we're ready to move on. Seven four food service. So we've talked about this at the local board. There was a presentation done at the full board. Um, the full board wanted to bring it back to the local board. Um, Terry can talk to you about the conservative figures in regards to what we believe we could save our son in regards to centralizing food service, what I'll, I'll give you for updates again, because not everyone was at the SU meeting, is that um, Tara, Bill Bonsignor, who oversees the USDA foods program that we've been getting complete reimbursement on, and I all met with our SU food service staff prior um, to the full SU board meeting and talked about to them about the concept of, if we were to centralize, the focus really is about capitalizing on each other's strengths, but also coordinated menu efforts, not meaning that you can't still do a special Friday, you know, let's use what's in the garden meal, but coordinating overall our menu efforts to learn from each other. I think there's certain schools right now having more success with others based on their menu planning, but then in addition, bulk purchasing. Um, in order to make certain that we are really capitalizing on our ability to bulk purchase. Right now we, we purchase at each local district. Um, now, do we still have the buying power of someone who is a food service contract? No, right, provider, no. They, part of how they're able to do their work at a much more efficient cost is that they can buy for all their schools. We're just gonna buy for the SU schools, but still, there's going to be some savings realized there. And so Tara can talk to you about what we're projecting. I feel like these are solid numbers. Um, it's probably not gonna be as much as maybe you would like, um, but at least they're headed in the right direction. I think in general, this is a start to a much more frequent and longer conversation around food service, sustainability of food service, quality product, and how do we do it at a most efficient cost, keep the product up, make certain we have the connection to fresh fruits and vegetables in our community gardens, make certain that it's tied into our curriculum and programming, but also make certain that it's not coming at the cost of personnel. Um, and so that's really my focus around this. I just thought it was important for folks to know. My focus is really about how can we do this at a rate that that is you know manageable so that it doesn't result into us getting to a point where we're having <laughs> to do staff because we're using that to supplement food service um and so that's kind of why I, I keep bringing this up and wanting to have the conversation i don't think centralizing to the su is going to be the end-all be-all for us but i do think it is a really important step for us to take to try to find some efficiency because right now um, we're struggling with that. Now, certain programs are still in the black. So I think there's things to learn. Um, you know, my food service program in Tunbridge um, is still, you know, breaking even and or making a little money at times. And so that's a positive. So what's going on there that we could better implement across um, RSU in a wider scale? What do you need from us tonight? Nothing. I just want to make certain you're okay with me continuing to have the conversation. I'm not looking for, for any action or anything. I just want to make certain you're not getting annoyed with me talking about it. No, I, I got to say, personally, I, I, was, I was game with this when you talked about it with our last meeting. And then that the full board passed on, I was like, 
I don't know. Let's let's go. Terry, can you give them a, a sense of what we were projecting we could save for our set alone? If for they were to Stockbridge, we're looking at potential savings of eighteen thousand nine hundred and thirty dollars. And that comes from the as Jamie was saying, the ability to purchase on a larger scale for all eight of our buildings versus each individual buying on their own power. And also doing uh, common menu planning, which will help with not buying a lot of overage for inventory where some of our smaller schools, you know, they got to buy a case of chicken. By the time they get around for the second round of chicken, it could potentially be freezer burn. So we reduce waste because we're purchasing on the grander scale and getting what's actually supply and demand out to the schools versus having a lot of overage in inventory. And also really capitalizing as Jamie indicated, and if you were in the meeting with Bill, in the SU meeting, capitalizing on our food service team's strengths. I mean, we have some food service team members that are phenomenal at the paperwork side of it, where others, it's like their worst thing that they have to do. And just to have that ability to work together and to do that, it saves time on them working outside of their contract to get all this paperwork done and all the rules and regulations that we have to follow. And there's a lot of stuff that we have to do during the summer that's not part of you know what their, their contracts are today. So to really have that flexibility and to be able to do that, I think overall, and just the compliance pieces alone, we'll see some pretty good savings. Um. I'm very curious, Tara, when we when we think about that, you know, I understand the bulk purchasing piece of it, but what, you know, we've developed, you know, certain, you know, local kitchens have, have developed recipes and meals that their kids like. And what I what I wonder about is, will we still, you know, when the bulk bulk purchasing works out, will the local facilities be able to say we want to make you know, our said pizza, because it has this, this and that in it. And we'll get that particular sausage or that particular vegetable combination or whatever. Or will it be all like, is your vision of money saving that the, the SU says it's going to be Taco Tuesdays and the tacos are going to look like this and they're going to be flavored this way and you'll just get them. There are very specific rules and regulations around what actually has to be compiled in those meals. And where schools have particular recipes that are their students' favorites, those recipes could be shared with other buildings throughout our supervisor union because I'm sure if kids love it in Rochester and Stockbridge, kids are probably going to love it in Sharon and Stratford too. So, you know, to have that ability and, you know, perhaps they don't have the options in their building now to make those kind of purchases if there's a certain kind of sausage that tastes better than others. So no, I'm not going to micromanage what you have to pick off your product list. And just so you know, I'm so passionate about it. Uh, I'm doing a meatloaf throwdown March 26th at the Chelsea School. <laughs> so I've challenged all the cooks, superintendent, cook, throwdown. And uh, that's happening March 26th in Chelsea. So, and if you want to look at footage when I was younger and skinnier, there is a WCAX clip of me doing a throwdown with my cook from Williamstown. You can probably find that on the web somewhere. I went on set and did a cook off. So stay what? tuned with that. But th those are the types of things we need. We need to market our food service too, right. is what I'm saying. And we need to make it fun and enjoyable. And I think we are doing that well in certain areas and not in others. Um, and so that's one of the things I'm, I'm looking to do too, is like, how can we learn from each other to make food exciting, enjoyable, and a real experience for our kids? So I hope the meatloaf throwdowns help with that. Amy. Uh, yeah. A question about the bulk buying, um, like your example with the chicken is with the, with the bulk buying all go to a central location and then be distributed out to the schools or the supplier is able to uh yes we have delivery sites so okay. we if we as a supervisory union need to order 15 cases of chicken breast we order 15 cases of chicken breast say red royalton bethel needs four cases but stockbridge you know only needs one you know stockbridge that kind of thing 
where each school would buy one case of chicken, they're not going to get the same pricing that we're going to get at 15 cases of chicken. So that's the way these food service product companies work. The more you buy, it's like when you go to Sam's or BJ or Costco, you buy in bulk, you save money. Right. And the supplier is able to distribute it to various sites. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Any, oh. Food allergies. Good question. Jamie's not there. Tara, do you talk about that? Yes, food allergies would still be documented and tracked at each of the individual campuses as they are today. Cool. So yes, just on butter instead of peanut butter. <laughs> it's the short of that one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, and Rochester orders sun butter versus peanut butter too. I think it's just a matter of what you choose off your list. And I actually think the majority of our districts are sun butter districts anyways. Not that it really matters today, but. <laughs> and while he's out of the room, I'll say that I'd say it to his face too, but he needs to come to Stockbridge or Rochester for a chili cook-off because I'm the reigning champ from the PT. Oh, see, I think meatloaf is Jamie's specialty. So I think that's why he picked the meatloaf. Ah, I was okay, going to a little trash talk. <laughs> this, is, this is wonderful, wonderful. It also means we can move on, I think. Um, I, I, I would like to just go around quickly to the board and say, are we all um, game with this? Jenny, are you good for Jamie to go with this? Yeah, Into that sounds, that all sounds good. Good. Amy, are you good? Yeah. Go uh, uh, for him to continue and to investigate uh, about this and, and talk to us more, for sure. Great. Thank you, Megan. I completely give Jamie my whole heart. I think it's a great idea. I'd like to hear more about it. Great, Carl. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm completely on board. And as a matter of fact, I will totally challenge Jamie for both meatloaf and I forget now what, what Lindy was saying that, that she would make whether it was chili I'm, or whatever. I'm the reigning chili champ. <laughs> oh, I will take you down. I, I believe that thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Good, thank you. I believe that's normally in February in non COVID um, time. Everybody. Right. <laughs> Good. Jamie, you have our uh, you have our support. Please go forward. Jamie and Tara, I should say, sorry. Uh, you have our support. Please go forward with this and uh, continue keeping us updated. Good. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Where are we? The audit. 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 Fun, fun. How's it going? So I emailed you all the audit um, with a little cover memo outlining the high points. Um, not sure if you have any questions. I didn't receive any specific questions. But my hope is that you can accept the audit so we can get the finalization process done and get the documents out to the necessary parties that we have to get it to, the Agency of Education and the Vermont Bond Bank, and also get it available to your residents. Do we have any questions about the audit? Jenny? I do not. Amy? Uh, no, I haven't had time to do a full review, but um, I have no questions, and I, I think we can move to accept it. Carl? Um, I have an issue with the, the um, comments around the food service program. Um, the, manage the management letter talks about how we have no budget. We just have a, uh, um, a fund transfer and how that's inappropriate and we should have a budget and you know the the the, the idea that the the su response to that was that well we will um sort out you know an answer and you know it's going to be it's going to be happening here i'm i'm, I'm concerned that especially because we have unallocated uh um budget uh, surpluses that may or may not be restricted funds um, that, you know, we're kind of sloshing around a lot of money.
Do we have a response? The audit remark about the budgets is because there isn't a formal budgeting process completed in food service similar to the way that you do your general fund. And that was their recommendation. And that's one of the items that we're working towards while we're doing this process of centralizing is determining cost versus revenue for each of the individual food service programs. Um, as far as surplus, I got a little lost on your last comment there, Carl. So if you want to clarify that, maybe I can attempt to answer it. Well, no, it's it, it's the idea that we um, cannot, you know, we, we don't need to budget for food going forward because there's going to be an SU food budget um, versus the idea that, um, you know, we've, the, the, the audits report that, We've traditionally ran a deficit and an unbudgeted deficit and the audit reports that we should probably have had a, 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 a budget in the past so that we wouldn't necessarily be running these random deficits. Um, what I'm interested in is the response around, you know, why we didn't have a budget or um, and then certainly we're jumping ahead to the, to, to, to comments around the audit, but, um, why we didn't have a budget and, you know, why, when they're defaulting, when the, when they're slamming us for basically saying we just had a uh, unidentified fund transfer to the food to the food service, we should feel comfortable approaching a budget that doesn't have any kind of food money in it, in, in whatsoever. It seems to me like the auditors are saying we should be really digging in and analyzing and budgeting for our food. And the advice from the SU was like, don't bother putting that in the budget. And, you know, OK, we'll let you put 20 grand of transfer into the budget. But somehow that. You know, this was all going to be covered. I'd like to understand what the differences are between those two positions. So one, none of the districts sat down with their food personnel and built a budget. Um, historically, Carl, that's not okay. And so what we'd be looking to do is, is if you give us permission at the SU level is to finalize an SU level food service budget. And so Chris Lacarno was at the last full board meeting he is the CVSU chief financial officer. And I had mentioned that we created an MOU with the CVSU. Chris has provided us with templates on how to build a food service budget. And so what we're looking to do is to execute those templates. We wanna run it at the SU level for a year. And then at, at the end of that year, we would retroactively build back the districts in next year's budget. So you would budget accordingly based on the outcomes of us executing that SU wide budget. And so it doesn't mean we're not gonna budget for it, but we couldn't, we weren't gonna charge you an assessment for it because you haven't agreed to do it yet at the SU level. So every year you will be assessed based, so next year's budget at RSUD will have a built-in assessment based on how we did in 2122's food service. Wow. So we, once we execute this, then we will build that into your local budget next year. And then we will assess that money out. And then come the next fiscal year, we will assess that money out. And so every year we will be assessing based on that retro, it's retroactively. We got that. Mm -hmm. Now we went over this. We've gone over this now, you know, twice in the policy. Uh, I, I think you're just saying that they didn't see budgets before in the audit. And so they think we should have budgets. We're going about it in a slightly different way as opposed to having budgets. We're going to do it this SU way. Well, that's what I'm hoping the board agrees to, but we don't know that. Oh. If the board doesn't agree to it, then we will have an RSUD <laughs> budget they, you know, just yeah. like... Um, Chris is recommending we do for the SU, but you're absolutely right, Carl. It's part of why we got in trouble with food service is that we weren't using a standardized process to build food service budgets. 
Okay, so we're going to be using that food service process to build these budgets in advance of adapting said budgets. Yes. We went part over of what concerns what part of what concerns me and part of what I thought I don't know how well I expressed it at the 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 last meeting was the idea that we are going to say, well, we're going to see what we spend this year and we'll figure out how to bu budget for it next year. That we're, we're, we're rolling estimations forward versus we are looking at, you know, what we're actually spending. And Carl, Carl, I just want to be clear. We, we went over this last meeting. We talked about it as a board and we went over yes, this meeting. We did. And we made a decision. No, we made a decision. As a board, we made a decision that we were going to put some money back in, and that was the decision of the board. So I don't know that Correct. we need to talk about this no, again. No, no, you're missing my point, Ethan. I'm sorry. And I'm, 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 I'm I obviously expressed myself poorly. My point is to Jamie, is that this budgeted amount that we're looking at, you know, the thing we're looking at going forward, is not going to be a we're putting a blank ticket or a blank check forward and then we're going to catch it up by, you know, covering our, um, you know, our deficits. We're, we're budgeting and we're going to be actually thinking about when we put forward a budget to our taxpayers, that that money, you know, covers what we think is the best estimate that we think that our kids are going to eat for the next year versus the idea that we're going to let, a program cover our expenses and then we'll figure out how we'll pay it back later. That our budgeting for food is not going to have a skip year where we, where, no, where we say we're going to see what happens and then budget based on that. We're going to budget but Carl, you know, Carl. based on our best. I'm well, sorry, Ethan. I'm trying to explain myself. I know. We're going to budget on our best guesses for our skip year and say that next year we think with this with this program change is going to cost us X so that we're budgeting for it. And we're not saying that this year we're not budgeting for anything and that next year or two years from now, we're going to look at where we are and then we're going to recoup that money in like a, a back bill. That's what I'm trying to get an answer to. The idea of accurate budgeting versus back bill. This is what Charity Charity explained this when we got it. She she was the one she understood it. And she said it's a fairly Charity standard. Charity is not her business manager. So, Carl, let, let me try and just simplify this. First of all, we're not just going to pull random numbers. We are using all of the data that we have been gathering for this current fiscal year on what is being purchased throughout all of our individual districts, what it costs for salary and benefits for all of our food service staff in each of our individual mm -hmm. buildings. And then we are taking what we get for projected revenue based on the reimbursement rates that we get from the state of Vermont and the federal government to determine what our needs are going to be to have a SU wide food service program. At the end of FY22, once this program has been established, we will then be able to set the parameters for what is necessary for the school district's individual assessments based on non-program revenue that we can get. So we have to know what the food program can substantiate on their own before we can assess what the districts have to kick in, which is why you need that first year to establish the parameters of the program. Does that okay. make sense? And I, 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 I totally get that. But my point is, is like if I was save, saving up for a Disneyland vacation next year, I would start putting away money now. And we're saying that, okay, we're going to have a food service program that's going to organize everything in the future. But that brings in monthly revenue from sure. state reimbursements and paid meals. So this program brings in its own revenue on a monthly basis. 
Absolutely. And traditionally, that revenue has not compensated for the cost of the program, which is why we've always had to backfill it. Correct. Carl, I guess the only thing I can say is, is that I totally understand you don't agree with the strategy we, we used with this. And I totally respect that. But I, I can't speak other than to say we just disagree in strategy. And that's well, okay. I and get the, it. the other part of this, Carl, is that we have talked about this as a board and we've made a decision. And you may have your individual opinion, but we've actually moved on from food service. We're in the audit. And I think it's time to put this to rest. And if, okay. you, disagree, if well, you disagree with us, you disagree with I us. Was, but we, we talked see, about it as a board and we agreed upon it as a board. See, Ethan, I certainly, I certainly understand what you're saying. And I'm putting that piece of that to rest because we did in the past. The point is, if you look at the management um, letter comments from the, the auditor that, that were just sent to us now, those comments indicate that our, 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 our food service plan, you know, and the way that we're dealing with it isn't good. Because, Carl, you so guys the current, never budgeted. The current, the, yeah, the, the, they're saying the way we did we it. We have not yet accepted um, that audit, you know, as a board. But to indicate that my, my, my concepts and ideas are, are, are not relevant because we've dealt with them in the past ignores what the current audit that we have yet to accept says about those so things no i'm certainly willing and to let this I'm Carl, certainly willing we to are let this. we are addressing the recommendations that were made in the management letter with this program sure we are we, are. we absolutely budget we we, okay, this, we absolutely are well, we need to stop I'm responding Carl, and we are Carl, centralizing Carl, Carl, the food service program as yes, recommended. Tara, stop. This is not a productive discussion anymore. I will I just stop it right it's now. Not, okay. Certainly, Ethan, That's not you can stop it. I can withdraw from the conversation. And yes. if you ask me to do that as the chairman of the board, I will. My point here. I think you're making a good point, but I think we're going around in circles and we're not the time to talk about it. If you want to bring it up. We have accepted, we have we proposed a budget, we have voted on a budget. We have accepted We have. This is not a question about the budget. Well, then it's a policy, there's a principal question going forward. This, this program has not been approved. Bring this to the full board and bring this argument to the full board. When we um, talk about it there. That's but, what well, I think I we're done with I it tonight. Trying to do, but, you know, this is fine. I will, you know... <laughs> I will happily withdraw from this conversation and, you know, y'all can, 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 can continue because obviously I am, you know, a, a, a lone objective. No, it's not that it's the procedure of Carl. You like procedure and you do it in the right place. We're not talking about I this do. in the right place. Okay. If this is an issue, then let's bring it up before the full board, where the, which is where this is going to get approved anyway. I, I, everybody's heard your point. Why is it? Okay, Everybody's you are absolutely right. Point. You are absolutely I've heard your right point. We have not approved this. We think it's worth trying. The board has already agreed that it's worth going ahead to try this new way of looking at it. In a year, we may totally disagree with that. And that may put that us is in full, and you may be able to say to us at that time, we should have listened to you and put a full number back in there of the full budget. Now, that is the, but that is a decision of the board to make. And we made that decision at the last meeting when we put okay. that extra money out. So we hear you. This not is not you. about the, the this. I, I think you're misrepresenting my issue. And this is not about the extra money we put back in. But sure, I, I, I will drop the question. Move on. Good. I think we're done. The question would be, Ethan, whether or not the board is willing to accept. Oh, accept the, the accept. Yes, that's it. We need to go through that. Thank you. Uh, do I have a motion to accept the 1920 audit as presented by our business manager? I'd like to make a motion to accept the. 1920 audit as presented 
by our business manager. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? There being none, I'll do a roll call. Amy? Aye. Jenny? Aye. Megan? Aye. Carl? Okay, there we go. I got my phone to work. Um, I I, just, I uh, abstain. Good. Uh, Ethan, aye. The ayes have it. We accept the audit. Thank you. So now I will let the auditors know that the audit has been accepted. And upon receipt of the final audit, I will email it out to all of you. We will post it on the website. And then if anybody wants a physical hard copy of it, just let me know. And we can request bound copies from the auditors, or I can generate a hard copy here from the electronic version. They are one and the same. Good. Thank you, Tara. Much appreciated. I know that was a process as we heard about at the full board meetings. Sorry, I've lost my agenda. It's the warning. Um, so I think really at this point, the warnings drafted other than based on the outcomes of the articles of agreement vote tonight. And so I just need to know when you guys would like to schedule a special meeting to take up the warning. And then of course we would add the um, annual mailer. Um, and well, how we want to go about that. Those would be the I, couple agenda items. I would say there's going to be an agenda item depending on what we learn tonight about. Um, we're going to have to talk about that. Um, so that's another agenda item. I would say uh, sooner rather than later, I would say next week. My advice would be let's do it next Tuesday. Next let's Tuesday. The ninth. That's what I was going to suggest too. Um, we could um, do that, but we have two other board meetings already happening. So you could, you guys could roll, but you certainly wouldn't have Tara or my assistance because we got okay. Sharon that, and we've got Strafford next Tuesday. That's not useful because we're talking about bulletins. Um, what about Thursday? Thursday works. Lindy's nuts. Thursday. And there's Lindy's Our, nuts. I have an equity and diversity training from six to seven thirty on Thursday. Okay. The fourth or the eleventh. The eleventh, sorry, not the, not this Tuesday, but the. Fall. What about what about Monday the eighth? It is next, uh, next Monday, correct? Monday's all right, right, Ray? Monday, Monday's good for me. I just I don't see I any. I can do that. Jenny. That works. Monday the eighth works. Oh, Monday works for you, Jenny, or or I, you work? I'm sorry, I've been excluding that. Monday does work. Good, thank you. Megan? I'll make it work. Thank you. Okay. Monday it is uh, 6.30. Same time. And uh, we talked, we're going to talk um, uh, warning and we're going to talk uh, vote, results of the vote. And we're going to talk about, what was the third thing we were going to piggyback? Your budget mailer. Your mailer. My mailer. Thank you. Good. And Jenny, you and I will get together before then. Yeah. Um, Do you want us to try to get you some prices prior um, to some sure. quotes? Yeah, I've got and then you'll have that. I've got prices from last year, but yeah, if you want to show me some other ones, um, that'd be great. Okay. Or show us some other ones, excuse me. All right. Uh, we have no action. Well, we've accepted the audit. Um, we have no new hires, I assume. No new hires. Well, except for the big one. Um, and and uh, Anda, Andra, I, I keep getting her Anda. On Anda. Wanda without the W is how I'm remembering it. Good, that thank you, Anda, because I heard a lot of people are in the big full meeting only Andra. 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 Well, I butchered that all up. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think you might have. We have an it. Andra, and yeah. I Good. Okay, I'm going to go to public comment then. Thank you. All right. Let's work down our list, starting with Charity Colton. Do you have a comment for the board? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I have a comment and then a question, mm -hmm. um, or I guess two questions. So Tara and Jamie, correct me if I'm wrong, but anytime an accounting practice of any, a, any type of entity 
gets an audit like you guys do and there there are suggestions made or pieces of clarification that need to be made. There is an existing accounting 101 process that allows you to explain things such as changing from one budgetary platform to another when it comes to something like this food service piece. It's a simple explanation that happens as a response to the audit that you get. It's not a bunch of magic and having to put a bunch of extra numbers in there. It's just an explanation, just as you gave us verbally, correct? Yes, that is exactly what I had to do. I had to provide responses to the management letter. Perfect, thank you. Um, the other bigger question that I have is, as a parent with two kids in Stockbridge and three kids that have moved on from Stockbridge, I am continually concerned about the level of proficiencies. And I'm particularly concerned because I have two kids currently that I augment their education with private tutoring from a previous board member. Why, why are we continuing to have to do stuff like this? My kids and many other kids, as we saw in the numbers tonight, are not meeting proficiency levels, but you want us to support putting time, effort, money into an outdoor experiential program rather than putting more efforts into getting those math and literacy numbers up to an acceptable level. And I do understand that four kids in a classroom makes those numbers skew extremely fast. But I'm paying out of pocket for a situation that was addressed with my boys almost two years ago when a teacher stood in a hallway in front of a principal and said blatantly in front of other people, oh, by the way, your boys don't know how to read at a kindergarten grade level. Tell me that's not wrong and why I'm having to fix that out of my own pocket, but we're continuing to talk about adding experiential and elective opportunities when our kids aren't meeting standards. And yes, I'm emotional and passionate about this because mm -hmm. I was told when my daughter went, my oldest child who is now 25 years old, when she transitioned from Stockbridge to Whitcomb as a middle schooler, in seventh grade, she'll probably never graduate by that school's guidance counselor. She graduated and had no problems and aced her classes, did a Stafford program, and now she's a specialized occupational therapist. So it wasn't, it, it, this is an issue. Mm -hmm. It's a huge issue. But you want me to support an outdoor experiential program? No. Get those kids the programs they need to push math, science, English, the things that they're going to use in order to move into middle school and be prepared, not ill prepared, as most of my kids have been. I'm not an educator. I praise educators because they do what I would never even attempt to do. Lindy knows this. I'd say it to her all the time. But there is something wrong when we're accepting that kids are only 50% proficient. This is a public school. It's not a magnet school. So why aren't we focusing on the basics? Thank you. Gotcha, Charity. Um, and I, I'd say I hear you. Um, you know, your point point taken as far as priorities. Um, so um, I don't know if, if uh, Jamie wants to respond to that or not. Charity, I would just say that um, I too think we have a great deal of work to do. And I've been trying to emphasize that in my reports. And I know that the public doesn't always get to see the written reports. And part of why we're trying to reallocate our 
federal grant money from being what I thought was pretty top heavy at the SU level around how we were investing it and investing it out into additional professional development, trying to focus on math intervention and ensure that our teachers have the tools they need. Like we were budgeted to purchase new math programs at uh, both Rochester Stockbridge Unified District campuses um, in order to ensure that teachers have the tools they need to educate in math consistently. Um, those concerns are my concerns too. And, um, you know, I'm constantly in conversation with principals about how we progress monitoring all students, each individual student to ensure that they're making appropriate growth. Um, and so no, even though if, at times, if it doesn't seem like that, that's the focus of the conversation at board meetings, know that that's what certainly the focus is offline, not in board meetings, but in my admin team meetings and in my regular meetings with principals and teachers. So thank you for bringing that up. And uh, I couldn't agree with you more. The key foundational skills are crucial in the elementary grades for student success. All the research shows that by the end of the fourth grade, if students are struggling, their trajectory for dropout is significant. So thanks. Um, I, I just wanted to add in really quick that this has been a thing that um, when Michelle Ritchie, when I was on the board, you know, 10 years ago when she became our principal, one of the things that she brought up was this idea that the board should try to be tracking with the uh, middle schools that we were sending our kids to, you know, trying to get feedback from them as to what our kids were lacking or were strong in when they came to Bethel or Woodstock or Rochester, because Rochester was a, a, a K through 12 at the time, um, Rutland, wherever. Um, and we were trying to, you know, incorporate that into our, our, our curriculum work. And I think it's been a board priority, at least for me, um, you know, going forward in that. Um, I also would say that, it's, you know, trying to understand how to create a, uh, a, a, a program that identifies with all the kids in the area is a complicated issue. And it's one that we have as a, a Stockbridge board also been pushing to Montpelier to, you know, Sandy Haas and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Dick McCormick and, and, and encouraging our families to encourage the, the legislature to, to try it, to try mm -hmm. to uh, address that because again, the idea that you get a good education in, in your K through six school, but does that translate into a good transition into the uh, uh, seven through 12 grades has been a problem that we've been talking about, you know, when I've been on the school board for, you know, over a decade, 15 years. Um, Charity, I just want to make it clear that I, I, I hear you as a chairman. Um, I would only, and I think this is very much Lindy's point too, when she was talking, we were talking about outdoor and experiential learning. Um, we have to see that it helps the basic cores of education. We have to see that it's something that certain kids, many kids, really get something out of being outside and that it may help them. But that's certainly something we're going to look at at this program uh, level of is it actually helping the basic elements of education? And if it's not, and I think we'll get that feedback from the teachers and we'll probably get it from the students. We'll certainly see it in the testing um, that uh, they seem to see say that this is something that can help. It can help students focus. They can help students be engaged in education, an outdoor education program. Um, and I think you're making it very clear that we're setting it to a very high standard, that it needs to do that if it's going to be part of it. It needs to be helping this, what you're helping these basics. And if it isn't, well, then maybe it's not something for us. But that that's a standard we have to look to. So, Ethan, I, I just want to ask the question, and I apologize. I'm not trying to be rude to anyone by asking this, that, but so does that mean you see that the kids are can be used as sort of a guinea pig to see if this program will work because that's not fair. That's not fair to them. That's not fair to your teachers. That's not fair to their education. And that's 
somewhat what you just explained. We'll see if it's worth it. Love I don't it. want my children in that scenario. I would much rather petition to have my kids wavered out and get school choice than allow my kids to be utilized as guinea pigs to see if the program works. Fair enough. Fair enough. Thank you, Charity. Um, further comment, Janet Whitaker, do you have a comment for the board? No, I'm all set. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Joanne Mills, do you have a comment for the board? No, I'm all set. Thank you. Thank you. Karen Rubin, do you have a comment for the board? Um, you know, I think I just want to echo Charity's concerns. I'll be completely honest. When my son left Stockbridge Central School, he and the majority of his graduating class, and it was a pretty big one that year. Um, and of course, the parents do talk to one another, but most of those kids graduated that class as what we were reported with between a fourth and a fifth grade math skill level. That set him up to have a very, very difficult um, academic experience going into his middle school. And it, with a lot of hard work from his middle school and his high school teachers and academic counselors and, and um, you know, his, his support group. Um, and, you know, I hate to say he's, he's one of those kids who would, is actually thriving with this current situation. He is finally just now in the last couple of months of his senior year, feeling like he's become a confident student. And it's been very painful to watch him struggle all of these years with that much of a deficiency in his um, grade school academics. Um, I just, I know that we can't focus just on test scores, but we also can't expect these kids to go into other schools um, leaving Stockbridge Central and be behind the eight ball. And there were years where I would ask the teachers and I would ask the principals, you know, does he need to be tested? Can we get him tested? It wasn't until I actually met up with another um, teacher from a different school who said, have you ever put it in writing? Have you ever used the word due diligence and put it in writing that you wanted him tested? And it wasn't until that happened that we did get him tested and we did realize where his deficiencies were and they were the ones that were reported from when he left Stockbridge. Um, mm -hmm. And that was unfortunate because it was a struggle that he didn't need to go through. Um, so I, I appreciate that our kids love being out in the nature. I appreciate that we're teaching them how to um, value our world and our environment. I really, really do. And I think it's incredibly important as we move on for, you know, just sustaining life. Um, but they cannot be expected to be competitive in their next round of academia if they're not able to fully grasp uh, the standards that they need to leaving elementary school and going into middle school. So I just hope that that will always remain a constant in your minds that it's just as difficult for kids to enter into that next phase of their life and even more so if they don't feel that they can uh, be amongst their peers confidently. Um, so I, I just ask you guys to always keep that in the forefront of your mind when you're presenting us with having to decide on whether we're going to support one of your, your initiatives or not. So thank you. If I may just speak in a personal note for a moment, Karen and Charity, um, I was a special ed poster child, as I often say. Um, I left uh, my elementary school, which actually went through the ninth grade, 
um, uh, very unprepared uh, and and went to a high school where there wasn't a lot of support um, and I figured it out um, really on my own in a lot of ways. Um, but I really do hear you. I really do hear you. And I looked at those numbers and I was, um, I'll be honest, a little disappointed. I was well, more than a little disappointed, even though not to numbers and all that. I know we're turning battleships and increasing teaching proficiency and what Jamie's focus and all this is good, but I hear you. I really do know what it feels like to go on to another school and, um, and not know what you're doing and the terror of sitting in a class and just sitting there and going, I have no idea what I'm doing. So I, you, you're being heard, at least by me, I will tell you. Thank you. Um, and I believe that's it. Lindy Med, we have no phone callers. Thank you very much for your time. Those of you who commented and spent time and- uh... Ethan, Janet just raised her hand. I oh, sorry, Janet. Yes, go ahead, Janet. Well, I mean, I, I, I also, I feel really bad. I mean, I, of course I work at the school now, but I had three kids go to the school. I went to the school and I feel really bad, you know, when I hear the Karens and the charities and, um, but I guess as a parent, I always wondered, you know, could I have done better? Should I have put my kids somewhere else? Should I have, you know, a lot of should haves and, and I, I know even I struggled when I got out of Stockbridge school. One thing I think that really can be hard for kids is it seems like we're always having constant change. And I think that what we need is some consistencies mm -hmm. in the, the teaching staff and, um, you know, just that would help and not having chaos going on a lot. And it does seem like we have a lot of chaos a lot of times in this town. And I don't think we're immune. I think it happens in other towns. I don't think it's fair to, you know, always say that it's Stockbridge. Um, so I just kind of wanted to throw that out there um, because I too, as a parent, my kids were not, you know, super studious and I always will wonder, but I think they're turning out just fine. So <laughs> that's all I have to say. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. Thank you for all your comments. All right. Uh, future agenda items. I think we've already done that for next. Um, uh, we're hoping. Yeah. And we gave you some instructions for what's our next meeting. I believe our next meeting will be Tuesday, a formal meeting, uh, not our next meeting, but our next regular meeting will be Tuesday, April 6th, 2020 at 6 30 PM by Google meet. Um, our next regular meeting will be next Monday at 6.30, uh, March 8th. And I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. I would like to second that now that I'm back online. Excellent. Thank you. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Thank you all very much. Have a good, good night, night, everyone. Good night. Good night. night. <laughs>